This person requested Pythagorean theorem. So we start with the square, and then we have another square that's the exact same size. So these two squares are equal to each other. Then I'll make a cut that is the same size as A, and I'll do the same thing to the other square. Do the same thing to every side of that square, and the same thing to every side of this square. And then this other piece will be B. Then if I make a cut right here on both squares and pull this triangle out, this is the same triangle that's in our notes up above. So this side right here is C, this side is also C. And let's bring these down here. Next, so let's make another cut here where this is A and this is B. And let's make a cut here where this is C. And then if we pull both of these triangles out and bring them down there, these two sides should still be equal to each other because we pulled the two same triangles out of both of them. Now let's make some more cuts here, here, and here, and also here and here. We, we've now made more of these ABC triangles and we can pull them out and bring them down here. And so out of both sides, we've pulled four of these ABC triangles. So they should both still be equal. So this square right here is an A by A square. So the area of it is A squared. This square has sides B, so its area is B squared. And this square has sides C, so its area is C squared. We can call this left-hand side A squared plus B squared because we're adding these two squares together. And that's going to be equal to this right-hand side, which is C squared. And that's the end of this demonstration. Trust Fuller, I hope this helped. Thank you for the request. You are awesome. Let me know if you have any other requests, and I'll talk to you guys soon. Why is the area of a circle pi r squared? So we take a circle, we cut it up into a huge number of pieces. 10 is all I could fit for this example, but imagine much, much more. Then we pull it apart. And first we look at how long is this distance right here? Well, this is the radius of the circle. If you see that, it is just the radius of the circle is brought out with each of these slices. So this is the radius and we'll call it r. And that r is gonna follow it through as we bring these around. How long is this distance? Well, we know that this plus this is gonna be the whole circumference around the entire circle. So this down here is gonna be half of the circumference. And this up here would be the other half of the circumference. The formula for circumference is two pi r. So if we substitute two pi r into each of these, it says one half two pi r, and the one half and the two cancel. So each of these will just become pi r. And we'll clean things up a little bit. Now let's start to bring our pieces together. Now it started as a circle, we have changed into a parallelogram. So this might look like it has some bumps, so it's not a perfect parallelogram, but the more slices we cut it into, the more straight those bumps are going to become. And if we cut it into an infinite number of slices, those will become a straight line. And that's what's going to give us the parallelogram. Since this parallelogram is made up of all the pieces of the circle, we know that the area of the circle is equal to the area of this parallelogram. So what is the area of a parallelogram? It's base times height. So the area of our circle will then be equal to the base times height. Height. The base is the bottom here, which is pi r, and the height is this r right here. So we want to multiply these together. That's going to be pi times r times r, but r times r is r squared. So the area of the circle is pi r squared, and that's what we were trying to show. You guys are awesome. Keep the requests, comments, and follows coming. I'm loving it, and I'll talk to you guys soon. Bye. In my last video about the area of a circle and how it's derived, a bunch of people were asking about how the circumference is derived, and some people were asking about how pi is derived. I grabbed a pi and a pizza. Pi is defined as the ratio of the circumference to the diameter of any circle. We have a pi and a pizza here. I thought we'd measure them. So if I measure the diameter of this pi, it's 8 inches. If I measure the circumference, the circumference is about 25.1 inches. And we can do the same thing for the pizza. If I measure the diameter of the pizza, it's 15 and a half inches, and the circumference, circumference is about 48.7 inches. I'm actually doing this in millimeters. Pi is defined as the ratio of circumference to the diameter. So for each of these, if we do that calculation, we get numbers that are pretty close to pi. The only reason they're not exact is because my precision wasn't perfectly exact. But the size of the circle doesn't matter. I could use this tray here, or I could do this circle here, or I could even do a circle on this watch. If I measure the diameter on the watch, I use millimeters. The diameter is 40 millimeters, and the circumference, and the circumference is about 126 millimeters. So if we calculate that, we also get something close to pi. So it doesn't matter how large the circle is, they're all going to have that same ratio of the diameter to the circumference. So that's one way to find pi. A lot of people ask, how do you get the circumference of a circle as 2 pi r? We use the definition that we just used for pi. We say pi is equal to the circumference over the diameter, and then we multiply both sides by the diameter. So we get the diameter times pi equals the circumference. The radius of a circle is defined as half of the diameter. So that means that two radiuses equals the diameter. We can plug in 2r for the diameter, and that gives us 2r 
pi equals the circumference, and then we can rearrange everything to give us 2 pi r equals the circumference. And that's how the circumference is derived. So it's really just based on the definition of pi. You guys are awesome. Comment on what you'd like me to talk about next, and I will talk to you guys soon. Bye. Andy Bath. Let's talk about distance formula. We have an x, y coordinate plane, some random point on that plane. We'll call it x1, y1. And we have another point and we'll call it x2, y2. We want to know what is the distance between these two points. So if we connect our two points with a segment, the length of that segment will be the distance between our two points. We'll call the segment D. If we throw a grid down, we're not able to count diagonally to measure how long it is. We're only able to count perfectly vertically or perfectly horizontally, but we can express this distance using vertical and horizontal lines. So this grid isn't going to be a scale because we just made up x1 and y1, so we don't really even need the grid. This point right here, this is the x value of this red point. So this is x2. And this point right here, this is the x value of our blue point. So this is x1. This up here is the y value of our blue point, which is y1. And this right here is the y value of our red point, which is y2. So now if we call this bottom side A and this side side B, since these are made up of vertical and horizontal lines, this is a right triangle. So we know that a squared plus b squared equals d squared. It's the Pythagorean theorem, but we're going to leave this as d instead of c because d will stand for distance. Let's move this d to the other side. And now how long is a? Well, the length of a is whatever the distance is between x1 and x2. That's going to be x1 minus x2. And how long is side b? Well, that's going to be the distance between y1 and y2. So if we subtract those, we'll get the distance for b. And for the a, let's plug in x1 minus x2. And then for the b, let's plug in y1 one minus y2. Our goal was to find out what is d the distance. This is d squared. So we want to do the inverse operation of the square and that's going to be the square root. So we square root both sides and the left hand side just becomes d and the right hand side is left alone. And this is our distance formula and that's how it's derived. I'm loving these requests. You guys are awesome. Comment on what you'd like to see next. I'll talk to you guys soon. Bye. Andy Math. Can you solve 5i is less than 15u. This one's pretty important for people to fully understand. So in order to solve for a variable, your goal is to get that variable by itself on one side of the inequality. So how is this i not alone? Well, it's currently being multiplied by five. We want to perform the inverse operation on this five to make it go away so that our i can be by itself. We're gonna do that by dividing both sides by five. And then five over five is just one. So this side is just i less than, and then 15 over five is three, and the u is still there. And so now we of i is less than 3u. And if we rotate this less than 3 portion, and it says, I love you. What a nice message. You guys are awesome. I appreciate each and every one of you, and I will talk to you guys soon. Bye. I have a request to talk about the equation of a circle. First off, what is a circle? It's a collection of all of the points that are the same distance from the center. That same distance is called the radius, and we'll call it r because that's what the equation up above calls it. This blue point is xy. I'm not gonna make it x1, y1, or a or b. It's literally xy because it's made up of where it is located on the x-axis and where on the y-axis. And as the point moves, we want that x and y on the axis to move around as well. So we're gonna leave this as xy instead of x1, y1. If we look up at our formula, we have x, y, and r in the equation. We need to find some way to connect x, y, and r to each other. So if we draw a right triangle right here, this side we know is whatever it is from zero to x, which is just x, and this side is whatever the height is, which is just y. And now with Pythagorean theorem, we can just say x squared plus y squared equals r squared. This is the equation of a circle that's centered at the origin, where the center of the circle is at zero, zero. But our equation says the center is h, k. So let's move our circle over to the point hk. Let's bring back our triangle. This side on the bottom is no longer x. x is all the way from here to here, but this is an x. This point here is going to be h. So this side right here is going to be the distance between x and h. So we'll call it x minus h. And then this point up here, this is our y. And this point down here is k. We know the length of this is the difference between y and k. So it's going to be y minus k. And then the radius is still going to be r. So now we can update our equation. This first piece, since this bottom is no longer x, it's x minus h. This will change into x minus h squared plus, and this is no longer just y, it's y minus k is the length squared equals, and then it's still just r squared. This is our equation of a circle, and this is how it's derived. You guys are awesome. I absolutely love all these requests and all the follows. Comment on what you'd like me to solve for next, and I'll talk to you guys soon. Bye. Andy Bath.
Can you talk about the area of a trapezoid? The formula for the area of a trapezoid is one half B1 plus B2 times H. So it's the sum of the bases times the height. And each of these are called a base. So it's not just the bottom one, but the top one is also called a base. It's base one and base two. How is this derived? There's a lot of different ways to do it. Here's one that I like. If we duplicate this trapezoid, we now have two trapezoids. Then if I flip the second one upside down, and then scoot it over, we now have our two trapezoids are equal to one parallelogram. But we can conclude that the area of our two trapezoids would be equal to the area of the parallelogram. If we look at a parallelogram, if we cut out the triangle piece and then move it to the other side, the area of a parallelogram is the same thing as the area of a rectangle, which is just base times height. The base is this B1, which goes from here to here, plus this B2, which goes from here to here. So the whole base would be B1 plus B2. Next, we have the height, and the height of this parallelogram is this H right here. So this right here is the area of two of our trapezoids. In order to find out the area of one of our trapezoids, we're just going to divide one half. One half of the area of two trapezoids is the area of one trapezoid. Trapezoid, that's equal to, and then we can rearrange this to look just like this. And now we're done. So that is one way to derive the area of a trapezoid. Now let's get rid of this second one so we can have nice clean notes. Now let's put a box around it. And the most important piece, the andymath.com logo. You guys are awesome. Comment on what you'd like me to solve for next. I'll talk to you soon. Bye. So why are circles and squares the only shapes with 360 degrees? This is such a great question. Let's talk about this. So if you have a polygon, here's some examples of polygons. If n is the number of sides, you can find out the total number of degrees inside of that polygon. So for triangles, for example, if we plug a 3 in for the n, 3 minus 2 is 1. 1 times 180 tells us that these three angles add up to 180 degrees. We can also do it for a square. If we plug in a 4 for the n, 4 minus 2 is 2, and 2 times 180 equals 3. 360. And that means these four angles add up to 360 degrees. And we can repeat this for all the other polygons and find out the sum of all the interior angles for each of these shapes. A pentagon's 540, a hexagon is 720, an octagon's 1080, and so on. So why is it that a circle is said to have 360 degrees and a square has 360 degrees, but none of the other shapes do? Well, what is so special about a square and a circle? Well, the trick here is this 360 degrees in a square is adding up angles. In a circle, that 360 degrees is your central angles. If we add up all of these, these will always add up to 360. So the reason they both are 360 is it's measuring different things. So if we cut up a circle like this, and here's the center, if we pull them out and do this with it, we can see that they form a square. Let's bring these back. You can see that this angle right here was this angle, this angle was this angle, this angle was this angle, and this angle was this angle. It's true, they both have 360 degrees, but they're just measuring different things. That was an amazing question. Thank you so much. Comment below on what you'd like me to talk about next. You guys are awesome. And I'll talk to you soon. Somebody asked me in a previous video, don't you need to flip the inequality? So you could just memorize these rules, but I wanted to show some examples of why these are the case. We'll fill out a don't flip the sign and a flip the sign chart. So let's start with three and seven. Which is bigger, the three or the seven? Well, the seven's bigger. Now, if I add one to both sides, one plus three is four and seven plus one is eight. Which one of those is bigger? Well, the eight's still bigger. We did not flip the sign here, so I'm gonna add addition to this list. Next, let's do subtraction. Let's subtract two from both sides. Four minus two, Two gives us two and eight minus two gives us six. Now, which of these is greater? Well, six is greater. So with subtraction, the sign didn't change again. So let's add subtraction to this box. Next, let's do multiplication. Multiply both sides by three. Three times two is six. Six times three is 18, which is larger. The 18 is larger. The sign did not change. So let's add multiplying by a positive number to this box. And now let's try division by a positive number. Let's divide both sides by two. Six divided by two is three. 18 divided by two is nine, which is bigger. The nine is bigger. Once again, the sign did not change. So let's add division by a positive number to this box. Now let's test multiplication by a negative number. Let's multiply both sides by negative two. Negative two times three is negative six and nine times negative two is negative 18. Which one of these is larger? This one isn't as easy to spot as the other ones, but if we look at a number line, if we have zero here, negative six would be here and negative 18 would be way down here. So we can see that the negative six is the larger number. 
number. So the sign is going to go this way. And if you notice, it did change direction here. So under flip the sign, we're going to put multiplication by a negative number because the sign changed directions. And now let's try division by a negative number. Let's divide both sides by negative three. Negative six divided by negative three is two. Negative 18 divided by negative three is six. Which of these is larger? We can see the six is larger. And once again, the sign changed direction. We went from greater than to less than. So we need to put division by a negative number in this box. So this is just a quick demonstration of why multiplying and dividing by a negative number changes the sign and how addition, subtraction, and multiplication do not change it. Are you guys familiar with mortality tables, insurance companies, companies with retirement plans for you, social security administration? They all keep these tables to predict how likely someone is to die so they know how much money to keep aside for them. It can be morbid, but it's also kind of interesting. There are different formats for mortality tables. This isn't my favorite, so I'll probably make another video showing my favorite layout for a mortality table. This one's good for my first video on this. And basically it tells you if you're age zero, what is your probability of dying in the next year? And then what is your total life expectancy? So you can see here that probably of dying in the next year, if you're 10, is pretty small. And as you get older and older, it starts to get a little bit higher. And then as you get very old, it starts to get much higher. Someone who's 83 has an 8% chance of dying in the next year. And like I said, this is used for insurance companies and Social Security Administration who deal with large amounts of people. So they can be pretty confident that if they're dealing with 100,000 people, around 8% of those people will die in the next year. And that's kind of what these tables are used for. It's not saying you have an 8% chance of dying next year. It's referring to large groups. If you're incredibly healthy, you're probably more likely to live. And if you are incredibly unhealthy, you're probably one of the people that are more likely to die in the next year. For this video, the one thing I want to show is if you're 24 and let's say your parents are 54, did you know that they actually have a higher total life expectancy? So if, if you're 24, based on this table, you're expected to live to be 77.14. And if we look at your parents at 54, they're expected to be 80. So why are your parents expected to live longer than you? You're 77.14 and your parents are 80.32. And some, some people might say, oh, that's because there's more plastic in our diet and, and there's more smog in our air and we have lower quality of life. That's not what this table is talking about. The way to think of this is your parents have already made it to 54. They've survived all of these kill-offs every year. But for you as a 24-year-old, you've got to survive all of this stuff first before you even make it to the 54 they are. And so the table's figuring out that some 24-year-olds are going to die before then. And that brings down the expected life expectancy for 24s on average because of all these. I don't know if I did a good job explaining this. Another thing we can look at is let's find someone who's 115. If someone is 115 years old, they're expected to live to 115 and looks like about 10 months, 11 months. So they're not expected to live much longer, but they are expected to make it to 115. Do you think you're going to make it to 115? If you're a 24 year old, you're probably not going to make it to 115. So the whole idea is, is that this person who is already 115, they survived all of these years and made it to 115. And now that they've made it to 115, they've just got to survive a little bit longer to make it to 115.84. So someone who's 115 is way more likely to make it to 115 in 10 months than someone who's 24. And that's kind of the idea. It's just less obvious when we're talking about your parents who are 54 and you who is 24. Can you do a problem with angles outside of a circle? I think this is the type of problem you're talking about and I love these problems. But how do we solve for this X outside the circle when they give us that this arc is 80 and this arc is 20? We can look at the notes. What the notes say is in order to solve this outside angle, you take this larger arc that's cut, that's the C, and you subtract the smaller arc, that's the B, and you divide by two. So no matter if it's two secants, if it's a tangent and a secant, or if it's two tangents, it's always going to be the same pattern where the larger arc minus the smaller arc, the larger arc minus the smaller arc, they're all three going to follow the same pattern. And the stuff outside of your lines doesn't matter for this particular equation. So if we just remember that outer arc minus inner arc divided by two equals the outside angle. Let's go back to our problem. So we're going to do the same thing here. Outer arc arc, which is this 80 from here to here, minus the 20, which is our inner arc, divided by 2 is equal to x. Then 80 minus 20 is 60, and 60 divided by 2 is 30. So this right here is 30 degrees, and we can check the answer, and there it is, 30 degrees. If you want to try more of these, I got this page on andymath.com where you can try more of them. Here's one that's got a little trickiness to it. It's got the x on the outside attached to the arc, and they give you this angle here, and you have to solve for the x. Here's the link to the page. Send me any more requests you have, and I will talk to you soon.
So I've gotten this question several times uh, in different forms. But the whole idea is what is the co and cosine, cotangent, and cosecant? When we're doing trigonometry, we have sine, tangent, and secant. And then we also have cosine, cotangent, and cosecant. And if we write out the words sine, tangent, secant, and the words cosine, cotangent, cosecant, we can see that each of these is the exact same word, but just with a co thrown in front. So what does the co mean? Well, the co is short for complement. And if you remember, complementary angles are any two angles that sum to 90 degrees. So if we have a right triangle, all triangles, the sum of the interior angles is 180. And since it's a right triangle, that means this one's 90 degrees. That means these remaining two have to add up to 90. So these two angles are complementary angles. We'll label the angles X and Y. Let's label the sides A, B, and C. And let's look at only sine and cosine for a minute. So now we have a sine X and a cosine X. I propose, because this is a cosine and we're talking about complementary angles, if we change this X to the complementary angle, the Y, then these would be equal to each other. So now we have sine of x is equal to cosine of y. So let's check it. Let's see if this is true. If you know your Sokotoa, sine is opposite over hypotenuse and cosine is adjacent over hypotenuse. And since this is sine of x, it's going to be the opposite of x and the hypotenuse of x, and it'll be the adjacent of y over the hypotenuse. Let's do this first. What is the opposite of x? Well, the opposite side is this a right here. So this is a. And what is the hypotenuse? Well, the hypotenuse, no matter what, is going to be c because it's opposite the right angle. So this is going to be a C. And now let's do this. What is the adjacent of Y? So now if we look at angle Y, the side that's adjacent to it is A. B is opposite, C is the hypotenuse, and A is the adjacent side. So this right here is going to be an A. And then the hypotenuse is still just C. A over C is equal to A over C. Therefore, the sine of X must equal the cosine of Y. This is true for the other relationships as well. Tangent of X equals cotangent of Y, and secant of X equals cosecant of Y. And that is what the co means for for trig functions. Thank you for these questions. You guys are awesome. Comment on what you like me to solve for next, and I'll talk to you guys soon. Bye. Can you solve root 54 minus 14 root 5 without a calculator? What are you guys doing to me? This is a crazy request, but I will do it. It's hard to see it, but hidden in here is a perfect square trinomial. So we're going to use the notes for perfect square trinomial. Next, in order to set up the perfect square trinomial, I'm going to break this 54 into a 49 plus 5. And next, I'm going to move the 5 over here. So we can see all I've done so far is just split the 54 into a 49 plus 5. Now I'm going to rewrite this 49 as a 7 squared and rewrite this 5 as a root 5 squared. So this 49 changed into a 7 squared and the 5 changed into root 5 squared. Now I've set this up so that if we look at the notes of the perfect square trinomial, we can see that a is equal to 7 and b is equal to root 5. This is the formula for perfect square trinomials. Plug in a 7 for the a and a root 5 for the b. And then this 2 and this 7 can combine. And now we can see that this right here is the same thing as what was inside here. So I'm going to substitute this in for the place of this inside of the square root. And there it is right there. So the square root symbol and the square cancel each other out. So we're left with just seven minus root five. And that is the answer to the question. What do you think? I've been getting some criticism for not being rigorous enough on some of my videos. So for the rigorous police, this could also simplify into root five minus seven, but root five minus seven is less than zero and seven minus root five is greater than zero. But when we're talking about square roots, you only count the positive value, the values that are greater than zero. So root five minus seven would not count as a solution to this. Only this one, which is greater than zero. So that is the answer to the question. Hope this made sense. You guys are awesome. Please send me more requests. I'll talk to you soon. Bye. Andy Math. A lot of people have asked me about deriving the quadratic formula. How does this become this? We subtract C from both sides. We factor an A out of everything on the left side. So to get from here to here, we just factored an A out of the two terms on the left-hand side. Next, we imagine one of these generic rectangles, and we're going to put the stuff on the inside here on the inside of this box. So the X squared will go here. Then this B over AX, we're going to split it up between these two boxes. Each of them is a B over 2AX. Now, if we start defining the outside, these two would be x because x times x is x squared. And then x times what gives us b over 2ax? Well, that's b over 2a. And same thing here, this would also be b over 2a. And then to find this missing piece inside here, we just do b over 2a times b over 2a. Well, that's just b over 2a, the whole thing squared. This x plus b over 2a times this x plus b over 2a is equal to the sum of all this stuff inside is right here. These two can add up to become just a simple b over a 
times x. So let's get rid of all this. Don't need this anymore either. So I'm going to rewrite this down here, but I want to put some spaces in there for me to complete the square. So if I put this b over 2a squared right here, I'll be able to change all of this into this. But before I do that, I also need to add a b over 2a squared on this side so that things are balanced. And then the reason there's an a here is because I have an a right here. This a is essentially being distributed to this thing I added to the left side. I also need this a to be distributed to this one so that both sides will be equal. This inside here now matches this, which means I can plug this into there. We're done with these notes. So let's get rid of this stuff too. Next, I want to distribute this squared to everything on the inside. So that would become a b squared over 2 squared, which is 4 and a squared. And then this a can cancel with one of these a's. Don't need this. Next, we're going to divide both sides of the equation by a. On the left side, these two a's will cancel. And on the right side, this will become a negative c over a, and this will become a b squared over 4a squared. I see two fractions on this right-hand side. We need to give them a common denominator. If we multiply top and bottom of this by 4a, both fractions will have a 4a squared for their denominator. We can combine them into a single fraction. So let's change the order of these. So next, we square root both sides of the equation. The plus minus is very important here because before we square rooted, this had a 2 right here, which meant the degree was two, so there were two solutions to this. We don't want to lose one of those solutions when we take the square root, so that is the reason why we have a plus or minus here. Next, the square root and the square cancel each other out, and on the right-hand side, we can square root the top and the bottom separately. The square root of 4a squared, we would square root each of them, so the square root of 4 is 2, square root of a squared is a, so that becomes 2a. Next, I'm going to subtract b over 2a from both sides. We have two fractions. Both of them have a common denominator of 2a, so we're going to combine them into a single fraction. And then let's bring this negative B in front. Those were the steps to change this into this. You guys are awesome. Please send me any other requests you have, and I'll talk to you soon. Bye. I got a request. Can you explain an infinite power tower? The idea is, is that this root 2 will be to the power of root 2, which is to the power of root 2, to the power of root 2, to the power of root 2, and so on. One interesting trick with power towers is that they're supposed to work from the top down. So you can't even do something like this and then do that to the power of 2 and do that to the power of 2. It doesn't work that way. We actually need to start from the very top. And how are we going to start at the very top? We can't do that. We can't start at the end of something infinite. Even though we're not supposed to go this way, we can still kind of see what it approaches by doing that method. So if we have the square root of 2, that's approximately equal to 1.4142. Square root of 2 to the square root of 2 is 1.6325. And then square root of 2 to the square root of 2 to the square root of 2, that'd be 1.7608 and so on. They start to slow down as they approach 2. But this one right here is approximately 1.9763. So we can see that as we continue adding more of these, it's approaching 2. But there is a way to calculate that it is exactly 2. So first, let's assign the whole thing x. So now x X is the value of our infinite power tower. So next I'm going to rewrite it like this, and this ties into what I was saying earlier. We need to calculate from the top down, so I'm grouping all of this stuff to do first. Now if we look up here, x is a square root of 2 going on forever, but that's what this is inside here. So I can replace this inside here with an x, and you can see this changes into x equals square root of 2 to the x. Right now I have an x on both sides. My goal is to get all the x's onto one side, so I'm going to exponentiate both sides to the power of 1 over x. Now these two exponents need to multiply. So x times 1 over x is just 1. So this is going to simplify into this. These two things cancel, so it's just a 1 right there. So this is a fractional exponent. We can also rewrite a square root as a fractional exponent. This is the same thing as 2 to the 1 half. And this is also kind of fun. Everywhere where I have a blue circle matches the blue circles on this side. If we made x equal to 2, that would make both these sides the same thing. Because x to the 1 over x would then be 2 to the 1 over 2. So we can conclude that x equals 2. And this is how to solve this infinite power tower. Comment on what you'd like me to solve for next. You guys are awesome. I'll talk to you soon. Bye. Now, if we have x cubed equals 1, we know that one answer is x equals 1. But what are the other answers? Because this is, has a degree of 3, that means there should be three answers. Well, there's no real answers that work, but there are complex answers that work, numbers that use imaginary numbers. So both of these solve it. So let's take this top one and let's cube it. And we're basically seeing, does it equal 1? So cubing it means multiply it by itself three times. So let's do that. I'll set up a box. So to multiply this, I'm going to do these two first. So now we're multiplying this 
one, which is this right here, by this one, which is this right here. So negative one half times negative one half, that's positive one fourth. And when we multiply this by this, we introduce a negative. And since it's one half, it's gonna have a four on bottom and then the I root three on top. This times this is the same thing. We have a negative and then the I root three on top and then two times two is four on bottom. And for this last box, we're gonna do I root three over two times I root three over two. I times I is I squared. Root three times root three is root three squared. And two times two is two squared. We can clean this up. I squared is the same thing as negative one. Root three squared is the same thing as three. And two squared is the same thing as four, which is negative three fourths. So if we pull all this stuff on the inside and add it all up, and if we combine these two, we end up getting negative I root three over two. And then one fourth minus three fourths is negative one half. So now all of this here, when multiplied, changes into this right here. So we can update that. And now we just need to multiply these two by each other. So let's erase all this stuff. So let's put this one on top and we'll put this one on the side. Negative one half times negative one half, well that gave us one fourth. So this guy right here times this would end up being a negative I root three over four. And this piece times this piece is positive I root three over four. So last we have this times this, which is negative I squared root three squared over two squared. The I squared becomes negative one and this negative one times this negative becomes positive. Root three squared becomes three and two squared becomes four. Now we can pull all this inside stuff out and add them together. These two pieces cancel each other out and then one fourth plus three fourths is equal to one. And that's it. We showed that this cubed is equal to one. So the same thing's true for the other one. So there are three solutions. This is true for any polynomial equation. Whatever the degree is, is how many solutions there are. It's just some of those solutions might be weird complex numbers. Hey, you seem like a pretty cool dude. Do you want to talk about zero to the zero and y equals one? No, zero to the zero is undefined, man. See, it goes like this. Zero to the zero is equal to zero to the one minus one, which is equal to zero to the one times zero to the negative one, which is equal to zero over zero. And division by zero Zero is undefined. Therefore, zero to zero is undefined. Okay, I like that. That was a fun demonstration. I knew right away you were a cool dude. Now I have a follow-up question for you. If we have zero squared, that would be equal to zero to the three minus one, which would be equal to zero to the three times zero to the negative one, which would then be equal to zero cubed over zero. But I see division by zero, and we know division by zero is undefined. So does that mean zero squared is undefined? That's a really clever argument, but that is not correct because these zeros would cancel and this would give you zero squared over one because you could cancel one zero from top and bottom and that makes your statement here incorrect so let's get rid of it okay that was a good argument i see how you did that you made this zero down here a zero to the one and then you basically subtracted one from each of these reducing both top and bottom by one term of zero so what is three minus one three minus one is two and what is one minus one one minus one is zero do you see what i see you got to your conclusion without even and realizing that you were saying zero to the zero equals one. You did zero to zero equals one. That's how you got where you were. Oh, wow. I was not correct when I said zero, zero is undefined. Instead, I should have said zero to the zero equals one. Going forward, I will now say that because that is what is correct. Zero to the zero equals one. Google says zero to the zero equals one. Bing says zero to the zero equals one. Have you heard of this guy, Euler? He discovered this. He said zero to the zero equals one. Are you really gonna doubt the guy that figured this out? In fact, you see this variable E? It's used in continuous growth formulas and all kinds of different stuff. Do you know why it's called E? Because of the E in his name. It's named after him. Even if you don't agree with zero to zero equals one, aren't you curious why tons of other competent people say that zero to zero is one? Here's why. It's called the empty product. It's what happens when you multiply by no factors. What this three means is that we are multiplying by three twos. That changes the number because when we multiply four by three twos, it now becomes 32. It's the fact that there are a certain number of twos here. That's what changes it. Now, if there were no twos here, we call it the empty product because there's nothing here. It's not being multiplied by anything. The answer is still going to be four. This space right here is a one, and that means two to the zero equals one. And this concept is called the empty product. The same same logic holds when it's zero to the zero. It doesn't matter if it's a zero or a two, there's an empty product. There are no zeros there. Therefore, our four is not going to change because it's not being multiplied by anything. It's an empty product. Well, the only way this is true is if that's a one inside there. This is the reason why so many people say zero to the zero equals one. Some people said zero to the zero is undefined. This is their argument. They introduce a variable X and they set it to the power of zero. This must be equal to X to the power of one minus one. And that's the same thing as X to the one over X 
to the one. And that's the same thing as X over X. Now the problem with this is division by zero is not possible. So we have to put a restriction on this statement. We have to say X cannot equal zero. Now when people see this, they go, oh, well therefore zero to the zero is undefined. But that is not true. It'd be more accurate to say X to the zero is undefined for X equals zero. Well, undefined means no definition. So in other words, algebra provides no definition for zero to the zero. So if algebra has no definition for zero to the zero, I'm going to defer back to the empty product, which tells me zero to the zero equals one. Something else people say is that zero to the zero is indeterminate. In this context, it means if you're taking the limit as X approaches a of a function f of X to the power of another function g of X, and each of those functions evaluated at a are equal to zero. And then we do direct substitution and plug a into both of these X's, we get f of a to the power of g of a. And now we get this thing that looks like zero over zero. But this is all built off of algebra. And if you remember, algebra has no definition for zero to the zero. So we cannot solve this limit with direct substitution. We have to use other methods. And here's a more accurate statement for this one. The limit as x approaches a of f of x to the power of g of x gives an indeterminate form if f of a equals zero and g of a equals zero. Look at all these qualifiers. This is not the same thing as this. This one deals with limits and functions and algebra and all this other stuff. This one is talking about zero to the zero, which means we have no zeros and it's an empty product. I do not believe it is a logical leap to go from here to here. And I'm going to defer back to the empty product, which tells me that zero, zero equals one. At exactly 255, what is the angle between the hour hand and the minute hand? And I'm talking about this angle right here. A circle has 360 degrees total and a clock cuts it into 12 even pieces. So the angle between each hour marker is 30 degrees, but we're not done yet because this hour hand here hasn't traveled the whole 30 degrees. Once this minute hand gets here, then it will have traveled the whole 30 degrees. So since this hand has only gone 55 minutes, in other words, it's gone 11 twelfths of the way around the clock. So that means this hour hand has only gone 11 twelfths of the way through this 30 degrees here. And when we do 11 twelfths times 30 degrees, we get 27.5. So this last one isn't a whole 30 degrees. The hour hand only traveled 27.5 here. So we'll do 30 plus 30 plus 30 plus 27.5. And that gives us 117.5 degrees. And that's how to do these problems. Andy math. At exactly 255, what is the angle between the hour hand and the minute hand? And I'm talking about this angle right here. A circle has 360 degrees total and a clock cuts it into 12 even pieces. So the angle between each hour marker is 30 degrees, but we're not done yet because this hour hand here hasn't traveled the whole 30 degrees. Once this minute hand gets here, then it will have traveled the whole 30 degrees. So since this hand has only gone 55 minutes, in other words, it's gone 11 twelfths of the way around the clock. So that means this hour hand has only gone 11 twelfths of the way through this 30 degrees here. And when we do 11 twelfths times 30 degrees, we get 27.5. So this last one isn't a whole 30 degrees. The hour hand only traveled 27.5 here. So we'll do 30 plus 30 plus 30 plus 27.5. And that gives us 117.5 degrees. And that's how to do these problems. Andy math. I wanted to talk about a common mistake people tend to make. If you have 2x plus 8 over 2, a lot of people want to just cancel out these 2s, and it doesn't work that way. It's going to end up going to both of them, so this 8 gets changed into a 4 as well. So the correct answer is x plus 4. I don't want you to have to memorize rules for this. I want you to understand it. So let's pretend these 2x are two gold coins. Now we can say the eight are silver coins. Now we're gonna split these up between you and a friend. That's what this divided by two means. You don't wanna only split the gold and leave the silver in whole. You wanna split it in half as well. So that's essentially what's going on. Everything on top needs to be divided by two. So then you end up with one gold piece plus four silvers for each of you. And that's the answer to the question. Andy math. Why is sine squared plus cosine squared equal to one? Let's talk about it. The Pythagorean theorem says that in a right triangle, a squared plus b squared will equal c squared. And if we call this angle down here theta, relative to that angle theta, a is the opposite, b is the adjacent, and c would be the hypotenuse. And so we can update our formula to say opposite squared plus adjacent squared equals hypotenuse squared. Let's divide everything by a hypotenuse squared. This on the right is just gonna change into one. And for each of these, we can take the squared out and make it just a single squared. And if you know Sokotoa, sine is opposite 
opposite over hypotenuse. So this opposite over hypotenuse right here is sine. And cosine is adjacent over hypotenuse. And so this adjacent over hypotenuse is cosine. And this last one is still one. And that gives us sine theta squared plus cosine theta squared equals one. And we're talking about sine theta squared. We typically write that as sine squared theta plus cosine squared theta. On a side note, if you're curious why we write it like this, we don't want to think it's the theta that's being squared because that's a possibility as well. So when we write the two here, it's very clear it's the sine that's squared and not the theta. What about the other trig Pythag identities? These are fairly straightforward to derive. So if you write out sine squared plus cosine squared equals one, divide everything by sine squared, then sine squared over sine squared is one, cosine squared over sine squared. Well, cosine over sine is cotangent. So this is cotangent squared. And then one over sine squared is cosecant squared. And then to get the other one, divide everything by cosine squared. Sine squared over cosine squared is tangent squared. Cosine squared over cosine squared is one. And one over cosine squared is secant squared. And that's how to derive all the Pythag identities. You guys are awesome. Comment on what you'd like me to solve for next. I'll talk to you soon. Bye. Did you know that if you grew up watching television, you're more likely to be alive than someone who grew up not watching television? Facts. Does this mean that TV saves lives? You might be thinking something like, well, yeah, you're more likely to get hurt riding a bicycle than you are sitting on the couch. And that might be true, but that is not why this statement is true. This statement is true because of the ages of the people in each group. The average age of all people who grew up watching television is around 35 years. The average age of all people who grew up not watching television is about 1,200 years. So it has nothing to do with television and has everything to do with age. And in this, age is called the explanatory variable. And this is just an example of correlation does not imply causation. You're awesome, I'll talk to you soon. What is something that looks easy but is impossible? I'll go first. You have a square with whole number sides. You can't find another square with whole number sides that has exactly double the area. For example, if you have a one by one square, the area will be one. And if you have a two by two square, the area would be four. And four is not double one. So it doesn't work to just double the side lengths. In fact, nothing will work. No matter how many possible whole number side lengths we try, we will never be able to double the area. We can get close, but we'll never get it exact. But it feels like we should be able to. All right, your turn. Why are square roots a one half exponent? This is an awesome question. Let's talk about it. What is the square root of nine? It's three. And one way you can think of that is that three times three equals nine. So what is the square root of X? Well, if we call it question mark, it would be question mark times question mark equals X. Let's make this X to the question mark instead of just question mark, because we're trying to find out what would that exponent be for the X. Let's take a break from this for a second. What is x to the 3 times x to the 4? Well, this means we have 3x's times 4x's. And if we count these, we have 7x's. So it's x to the 7. And another way to get that would be to add these two numbers. It would be x to the 3 plus 4. And we can do this in a general sense. If we have x to the a and x to the b, that's just going to be equal to the a plus the b. See, let's clean this up. We don't need this anymore, and we don't need this anymore. And let's move this up to the top. Next, let's give this side an exponent. A single x would just be x to the 1. And now following these rules, this x question mark x question mark would just be x to the question mark plus question mark and that's equal to x to the one so now we have x to some power equals x to some power the only way this can be true for all possible values of x if what's inside those two blue boxes is equal to each other so we can say question mark plus question mark equals one well, question mark plus question mark that's two question mark and now to solve for question mark we divide both sides by two and that gives us question mark is equal to one half and if you remember question mark was our exponent therefore this needs to be a one half. So this is why square root of x is equal to x to the one half. You guys are awesome. Comment on anything that's confusing for you. I'll do my best to explain it. I'll talk to you soon. Bye. 11 plus 2 equals 13. There's something unique about this equation. Have you ever heard of an anagram? It's where you can switch stuff around and make a new statement. Let me duplicate this equation and I'll show you that it's an anagram. We can switch the 1 and 2. So now we have 12 plus 1 equals 13, which is also true. These two equations are anagrams of each other. Let me show you something cool about this caption. I'll duplicate it. And guess what? This caption is also an anagram. If we pull out these letters and mix them around, it's going to spell something that's also true. And that is that 12 plus 1 equals 13. These two statements are anagrams, just like these two statements were anagrams. And what's really crazy is this is the same thing as this, and this is the same thing as this. Not only are these anagrams with each other, but they also anagram into the same thing, one with words and one as a mathematical equation. That's pretty cool. You guys are awesome. I'll talk to you soon.
Why do negative exponents move to the bottom? That's an awesome question. Let's talk about it. Five to the power of negative one is equal to one fifth. You just put the five on bottom. And x to the negative one is equal to one over x. You just put the x on the bottom. So imagine you have x to the fifth over x cubed. That means you have five x's on top and three x's on bottom. Three matching pairs are going to cancel. And so you're left with only two on top. This is x squared. And a shortcut to get that x squared is just to subtract five minus three. So you subtract the top exponent minus the bottom exponent. And this works in the general case is x to the a over x to the b, you just do x to the a minus b. So let's look at 1 over x. How many x's are on top? There are zero x's on top, so we say x to the zero. How many x's are on bottom? There's one x on bottom, so we say x to the one. Then by following this property, this would be equal to x to the a, which is zero, minus one. It's the top exponent minus the bottom exponent. Zero minus one is negative one. And if we get rid of all of our steps in the middle, we get 1 over x equals x to the negative one, which is the same thing we have right there. And this is why negative exponents go on bottom. You guys are awesome. Comment on what I should solve for next. I'll talk to you soon. Bye. Andy math. Is your phone number somewhere in Pi? If it's going on forever and it seems to behave randomly, it would make sense that your phone number would show up somewhere. So Pi's ticking along and then somewhere there's an 8675309 and it just starts back up again with all of its random numbers. You would think, yeah, it's possible. So here's my question. Are you telling me that somewhere in Pi, there's a list of a hundred consecutive ones and then it starts over again with three, nine, seven, two, four, three, whatever numbers? That seems crazy to me in the middle of all this randomness. There's just a whole bunch of ones. I'm pretty sure no one's proven this, but we suspect it is true. But we don't know for sure. You guys are awesome. I'll talk to you soon. Bye. Andy Matt. Show the relationship between Pascal's triangle and powers of 11. I didn't even know this was a thing. This is pretty cool. Pascal's triangle is created by continually putting ones on both sides and then in the middle, adding up the two numbers right above it in either corner. So one plus one is two, two plus one is three, three plus three is six. Something really cool shows up when you compare this to powers of 11. 11 to the zero equals one. That's a one. 11 to the one equals 11. Well, that's 11. 11 squared equals 121. That's one, two, one, and so on. At 11 to the fifth, it looks like it's broken because this is. 161051. Oh, this is 1510051, oh, but it's not actually broken. Watch this. If you say we can only have one digit in each of the slots, this 10 would carry the one over here, and the five plus one would make this a six, and the one is now gone. So this is a zero right here. And we have to do the same thing for this 10. This one is going to get carried over here, making this zero a one. And then this right here is going to be a zero, and then we have a five and a one. So now we have just single digits in each of the spots. And guess what? 161051. Oh, 161051. Oh, Five, one. And this will continue to be true even as we move on to more powers of 11. You guys are awesome. Comment on what you'd like me to talk about next. I'll talk to you soon. Bye. Andy Math. How does triangulation work? What is triangulation? You hear them use this word when they're trying to find the location of a cell phone or something like that. If we have a cell phone tower right here, and through fancy technology, we know that the cell phone is exactly 1.2 miles from here. Using just one tower, all we know is that the cell phone is somewhere around here. That's a lot of spaces for us to check. No one's gonna find a cell phone in a big circle. We need to hone in onto where it is. So we'll use a second cell phone tower. And now we know that it's say 2.4 miles from that tower. So now we know it's somewhere along Along this circle, but since we already knew it was somewhere along this circle, we've now narrowed it down to these two spots. That's pretty exciting. We know it's one of two spots. If we want to know the exact location, we want to find a third cell phone tower. Let's say there's a cell phone tower right here. Now, if we know the distance from that cell phone tower, let's say 1.8 miles, we can draw another circle for that tower. So now we know it's somewhere along this green circle, but the only point that all three circles will give us is that point right there. So now we found the cell phone. And the reason it's called triangulation is because these three towers are the vertices of a triangle. And that is how triangulation works. Hey guys, Nike's releasing this awesome pair of sneakers. The swoosh is extended out to look like a tailpipe. So you some pretty cool shoes and I want them now. But it says here they're not releasing until May 18th. So I'm on StockX to try to get them early. The lowest ask, I have to pay $444 to buy these. You can see that the original price, the retail price is 180. So how much more am I paying so I can guarantee I get a pair and I get a pair two weeks early? So we could just calculate what I'm gonna have to pay minus the, retail price and that gives me $264. So $264 is one way we can measure it. But I think a more accurate way would be percent increase. So this is the formula for percent increase. It's the new price minus the original price divided by the original price. So if we calculate that right now, it would be 444 minus the original price over the original price. So if we plug that into a calculator, we get 1.46. So we would say that's 146% increase. A 100% increase would be doubling the price. So this is even more than 
double the price. And that's how to do percent increase. Can you do a really long factoring problem? I like this request. I just made up this problem. This one looks pretty straightforward, but it ends up being a five-step factoring problem. So first we have four terms, so we're gonna do factor by grouping. So I'm gonna split it up into these two groups. 5x cubed is the greatest common factor for this first group. 5 times what gives me 20 is 4. x cubed times what gives me x to the fifth, it's x squared. Minus 5 times what gives me 5, that's 1. x cubed times what gives me x cubed, that's just 1. The greatest common factor here is 5, and I'm going to make it negative 5 to keep things clean. Negative 5 times what gives me negative 20, that's positive 4. And then there's no x's here, so this will just be an x squared. And then negative 5 times what gives me positive 5, that's negative 1. That was our first step. Now, since both of these have a 4x squared minus 1, I'm going to pull that out. When I pull that out, I get a 4x squared minus 1. And then what's left is the 5x cubed and the minus 5. And so far, this is a pretty typical factor by grouping problem. I'm going to change the order of these, move this one here and put this one here. So next, I'm going to pull the common 5 out of here. And you can see this is the same thing as this. This piece here is a difference of two cubes. Here's the notes for difference of two cubes. So my a cubed is this x cubed. So that means the a equals x. And the b cubed is the same thing as 1, so therefore b equals 1. So I'm just going to plug in x for a and 1 for the b. And so we're left with x minus 1 times x squared plus 1x plus 1. Get rid of all this stuff and stick this in that place. And last we go after this 4x squared minus 1. It's a difference of two squares. Here's the notes for the difference of two squares. I can see the a squared is my 4x squared, so that means a is equal to 2x. And I can see b squared is equal to 1, which means that b equals 1. So now I plug in 2x for a and 1 for b, and that gives me 2x plus 1. 1, 2x minus 1. So I'm going to put the 2x plus 1, 2x minus 1 right there. And now we factored it all the way. So this is the same thing as this. That is a very long factoring problem. You guys are awesome. Comment on what you'd like me to do next. Andy math. We have two towns, town A and town B. They are 60 miles apart. You travel from town A to town B at 30 miles per hour. Once you get to town B, you immediately turn around and drive back to town A at 20 miles an hour. What was the average speed of your round trip? Do you need a minute or do you think you already know? Did you say 25 miles per hour? If you did, I'm sorry, that's not right. First, how much time did it take us to drive from town A to town B? Well, our distance was 60 and our speed was 30, so that means the time was two hours. And then how much time did it take us to travel back? Well, our distance was still 60 and our speed is now 20, so that'd be three hours. We have the total trip of our time was five hours. So we're gonna use the formula rate equals distance over time. And what was our distance? Well, we went 60 miles this way and 60 60 miles this way. So our distance was 120 miles and then our time was five hours. And if you plug into a calculator, 120 divided by five, you get 24 miles per hour. 30 one way, 20 the other, the same distance, but your average speed was 24 miles per hour. Feels like it should be 25 though, doesn't it? And if you're curious, the reason why is because notice how we spent only two hours going 30 miles per hour but we spent a whole three hours going 20 miles per hour. So the fact we spent more time going the slower speed is what dropped us from the 25 we expected down to the 24. Now, if we drove for two hours at 30 miles per hour and then two hours at 20 miles per hour, that would have an average speed of 25. Did you know you can use Fibonacci to convert from miles to kilometers? I did not know this. So let's check this out. This is the Fibonacci sequence. You get it by starting with a zero and one, and then the next one you get by adding the previous two. So zero plus one is one. One plus one is two. 2, 1 plus 2 is 3, 2 plus 3 is 5, and so on. Well, let's Google miles to kilometers conversion. So I'm going to plug 3 into the miles, and it gives me 4.82. That rounds to 5. That's interesting. Let's try plugging in 5 to the miles, and that's even closer to 8, and there's an 8 right there. This is fun. Let's plug 8 into the miles. We get 12.87, which does round to 13. Okay, what happens if we plug 13 in for the miles? It's 20.92, and that does round to 21. I'm going to see if this keeps working. I'll plug in 21, and that's 33. 79, which does round to 34. Now let's plug in 34. And that's 54.717, which does go to 55. So I'm guessing this goes on forever. This is pretty cool. I don't know what we would do with that because we would literally need to know exactly 34 miles. This trick won't work for 32 miles or 25 miles or something like that. And even then it's a little off. But I think this is a fun one. Thanks for sharing it with me. Keep sending me more of these fun math facts. You guys are awesome. I'll talk to you soon.
binary is base two and we're used to base 10. So we'll say this is binary, all right, base two. Let's look at 214 and base 10, what we're usually used to. So in base 10, this is the ones place, this is the tens place, and this is the hundreds place. So this four here means four ones. This one here means 110. And this two here means two hundreds. And if we add all these up, we get 214, which is kind of silly because my answer is written in base 10 and this is already base 10. So that's why it's the exact same. But this is the idea. You would add up each of the place values. So where does this base 10 come in? Well, notice every time we moved over a place, we multiplied by 10. Second to third place, we also multiplied by 10. And we're going to keep doing that when we're doing base 10. And this first slot is always one. So base two, this is also going to be the ones place. But now to get the next one, instead of multiplying by 10, we're going to multiply by two. Two's place, four's place, eight's place, 16's place, 32's place, 64, and 128. Those are very difficult to write sideways. So now if we want to know what this is in base 10, we're going to add up all the numbers just like we did here. So we have zero ones, we have one two, so I'm going to put a two down. This is our one two right here. We have one four, so I'll put a four here. We have zero eights and one 16, zero 32s, 164, and 128. Now if we add these up, it's also 214. So these two numbers are the same. 11010110 in base two is the same thing as 214 in base 10. The real takeaway from this is that instead of multiplying by 10 for each place value, you're going to multiply by two for each place value. And that's binary. If I give you $1 per second, so the clock's ticking and I give you a dollar every second, how long do you think it would take to get a million dollars? The answer is about 11 days and 14 hours. So if I keep going every second, giving you a dollar, how long would it take to get a billion dollars? Take approximately 31 years, 259 days. That is way different. A billion is so much larger than a million. I, I can't even, I can't even picture it. Here's a fun fact about pi. It's approximately equal to 3.14. Now, if you take 3.14 and look at it in a mirror, the reflection literally says pi. Isn't that crazy? Put $1 in the bank at 2% interest in the year zero. What would it be worth today? First, let's go to antimath.com type in interest. And we want this one right here. Here's our formula. So amount at time T, this is what we don't know. This will be the amount we have in the year 2021. Principal, this is the amount at time zero. Well, he put $1 in the bank. N is the number of compoundings per year. The problem didn't mention that. We'll just pretend it compounds monthly, which I think is pretty common. Annual interest rate, we said 2%, so we'll do 0 0.02. And then time in years, what's well, 2,021 years. So let's plug things in. Is what we don't know. P is one, parentheses, one plus R is 0 0.02 over 12, because N is 12, so the power of 12 times 2020. Let's clean this up a little bit. Now we just got to do 1.001 bar 6 to the power of 24252. It's saying the answer is 3.463942755356 times 10 to the 17. So if I move the decimal 17 places to the right, the answer would be this much money. It's about 346.4 quadrillion dollars. That's a lot of money. All for just $1 put in the bank. Let's do the 0.87 bar. If we want to solve this, what do you think we would need to do to it? So if we were rewriting this as eight, seven, eight, seven, eight, seven, how would we get these eight sevens to cancel on us? What would we want to multiply it by? So when we multiply a hundred, we get a hundred X because that's what X times a hundred is. And then this times a hundred ends up being 87. And then what do we do next? So what is a hundred X minus X? And then what's on the right hand side? All of these cancel forever. What's our last step going to be? And this is where we get that 87 over 99. What is I to the power of 420? Somebody asked me this question. I thought it was an awesome idea. Clearly, the person is excited about the periodic nature of imaginary numbers such that we know that I is equal to the root negative one. I squared is equal to negative one. I cubed is equal to negative I. And I to the fourth is equal to one. And then it keeps repeating itself. So imaginary numbers have this periodic element. If you don't follow this, I have a video I made earlier about how this is all calculated. But how do we figure out to the 420? We don't want to list out these columns 105 times until we get to I 420. So so we just got to recognize what is the pattern here. Well, every four, it goes back to one. So I to the four is one. I to the eight is one. If we do long division and divide by four, that will tell us where we are in our cycle. Four goes into four one time, track, we get a zero, bring down the two, zero times, bring down the zero, it goes in five times, and there's no remainder. It goes through it exactly 105 times, and it's going to return back to one. So I to the 420 is equal to one. Comment on what I should solve for next. 
So there's a really cool trick with repeating decimals. If you have something like 0.8 or 0.87 bar or 0.835 bar, this is eight over nine. This one is 87 over 99. And this one is 835 over 999. All that you have to do is the number you have here goes on top, whatever it is. And then you put nines on the bottom and the number of nines you put down is the number of numbers you have under the bar. Pretty crazy, huh? If you don't believe me, I'm sure you believe me, but if you want to check it, you can plug into a calculator, 835 over 999, and you know it'll be 835, 835, 835. Or 87 over 99 is going to give you 0 0.8787, 8787. And we're going to do a quick little quiz. What is point bar seven? What is point bar three seven? And what is point bar one, two, three? What are those as fractions? The area of a circle is pi r squared. Why is that? How did they figure this out? You can split the circle up into pieces. I split it up into 10 pieces here. As we separate them, we can start to rotate them like this and line them up. And if we bring them together, I just took all these pieces of the circle and turned it into a parallelogram. Now it's true, these are little curves. The more slices you cut it into, the straighter those curves will be. And if you cut it into an infinite number of slices, all those curves will go into a straight line. So essentially the circle is the same thing as this parallelogram. The area of a parallelogram is base times height. So what is is the base and what is the height? If we pull our parallelogram apart, you'll notice that this base is half of the circumference. And the circumference is 2 pi r, so half of the circumference would be pi r. Next, let's talk about the height. If we pull out one of the slices, you'll notice that the height is the same thing as the radius of the circle. So we have a base of pi r and a height of r. Therefore, the area of this parallelogram is pi r squared. The area of a circle is pi r squared. Are there more even numbers or more odd numbers? Let's talk about the natural numbers. One, two, three, four, five, six, and so on. So since every even has a corresponding odd, we can say they're the same number of evens and odds. Their cardinality is the same. And since there's no stopping, this will go on to infinity. We call it countably infinite. Even though it'll take us forever to count them, we can still count them. Some people consider zero to be a natural number, but we can deal with that as well. If we scoot all these down and then we stick the zero right here, so now we still have a one-to-one -one mapping. Every odd has a corresponding even, and this will go on forever. So it's really weird. With or without the zero, they still have the same number. You would think adding that zero would make the evens more, but it doesn't. Something else cool we can do is if we list out all the natural numbers, we get rid of these odds and scoot these natural numbers over. We now have a one-to-one -one mapping of the natural numbers to the even numbers. So we have the same number of natural numbers as even numbers. How is this possible? Because the natural numbers are made up of odds and evens. So wouldn't there be twice as many? But there aren't. They're both countably infinite. Some casinos have introduced tables with a triple zero. The double zero is give the house an edge of 5.26%. How much does this third zero pocket change the house edge? Both the old and the new have numbers 1 to 36. The difference shows up when we look at the zeros. This one has 38 pockets and two zeros. This one has 39 pockets and three zeros. Let's bet $100 on odd on each table. So the possible outcomes are odd, even, or getting one of the zeros. If you get the odd, you get your money back plus another $100. And if you get anything else, you lose your original bet, so it's negative 100. All the probabilities in the double zero table are out of 38, and all the probabilities on the triple zero table are out of 39. There are 18 odds, 18 evens, and one each of each of the zeros. We're going to multiply this column by this column to get this column. And then we add these columns to get the expected values. So the traditional roulette is negative $5.26. Adding this extra zero makes it negative $7.69. Every game you play where you bet $100 on a triple zero roulette table, you're expected to lose $7.69. Why do we say a circle has 360 degrees instead of something simpler like 100 degrees? What do you think of my collection of circles. So I cut them up into different equal sizes. If we were to use 100 degrees, some of these come out kind of clean, but some of these degree measurements are tricky. These are not super clean to work with. But if we do 360 degrees, all these come out nice and clean. There's even more numbers that come out clean for 360. If we were to cut a circle up into 36 slices, each one would be 10 degrees. And if we were to do 72 slices, each one would be 5 degrees. So this is why we keep it 360 degrees. Something else, if you imagine the Earth traveling around the sun, since it takes 360 five days for the earth to travel around the sun, each day is around one degree. This isn't exact because it doesn't go around the sun in a perfect circle. It goes in an ellipse, but it's still kind of a fun little thing to think about that we move one degree around the sun each day. So if you take three halves minus three fourths plus three eighths minus three sixteenths plus three over 32 and keep continuing that pattern, if you do this forever, the answer is one. Here's a demonstration to show this. We'll call this infinite sum x. So let's multiply both sides by one half. That'll give us one half x equals three fourths minus three eighths plus three sixteenths and so on. 
So here's our X, here's half of the X. If I scoot this over a little bit, these conveniently line up. And if I add the two rows together, on this side, we get three halves X. And on this side, these cancel, because one's a negative, one's a positive. These cancel, because one's a positive, one's a negative. And these will cancel going on forever. So all we're left with is three over two. And if I multiply both sides by two thirds, we get X equals one. We originally called X this infinite sum. Therefore, this infinite sum is equal to one. You guys are awesome. I'll talk to you soon. Bye. Every bet on American Roulette has the same expected value. Let me show you six examples. All six of these have a winning outcome and a set of losing outcomes. If you win, every bet has a unique payout based on the odds. And if you don't win, you lose your original bet. All of the probabilities will be out of 38. They all have different probabilities of winning and probabilities of not winning. We're going to multiply this column by this column to get this column. And then we add all these up to get the expected value. And they're all negative 5.26. And this is true for all bets in Roulette. No matter what bet you make with $100, you're expected to lose $5.20. 26 cents. You have different probabilities of winning and very different amounts you can win. But if you play long enough, you're expected to lose $5.26 every game you play. You guys are awesome. I'll talk to you soon. Bye. Andy math. Have you ever seen one of these? Would you like to learn how to solve it? So we start at the bottom, n equals one, and then we go n equals two, n equals three, n equals four, n equals five. We stop when we get to this number. Next, we plug these different values for n into this function. We get one squared, two squared, three squared, four squared, five squared, and that would change if this function is different. Next step, we add all these up. One squared plus two squared plus three squared plus four squared plus five squared. One squared is one, two squared is four, three squared is nine, four squared is 16, and five squared is 25. If we add all these up, we get 55. So the answer is 55. That was pretty quick, but I hope it made sense. Comment on what you'd like me to solve for next. You're awesome. I'll talk to you soon. Andy the limit as x approaches infinity is equal to 1. If we sketch both of these, this top one is a parabola, and this bottom one is a parabola as well. The only difference is, for every value of x, it is 99 higher than it. And as these go on forever, it will always be 99 above it. So if it's always 99 above it, how can the ratio of one over the other ever be equal to 1? I'll show you a demonstration. Let's move this stuff down to give me some space. Then I'm going to divide everything by x squared. And now that I've done this, stuff can cancel. These x squareds can cancel to be 1. These x squareds can cancel to be one. This x can cancel with one of these x's, and this x can cancel with one of these x's. And this cleans up to this down here. Now we can use direct substitution to plug in infinity for x. And that's what we did right here. So these five over infinities are zero. And this one over infinity squared is also zero. And that gives us one plus zero plus zero over one plus zero plus zero. Well, that's equal to one. Even though one is always 99 above the other, as we go to infinity, the ratio is one. You are awesome. I'll talk to you soon. Bye. Andy. American Roulette and European Roulette. They both spin around with the marble thrown in and the marble ends up in a pocket. They both contain pockets for all the numbers from 1 to 36. 18 even pockets and 18 odd pockets. 18 red pockets and 18 black pockets. If you bet on one of the numbers straight up, the payout is 1 to 35. If you bet on even or odd or red or black, the payout is 1 to 1. The difference between the two, American has a 0 and a double 0. European only has a 0. That might not seem like a lot, but let's look at the expected value of each. Let's bet $100 on even. For American, you have four possible outcomes, even, odd, 0, or double 0. In European, you have even, odd, or zero. If it lands on even, we get our original bet back plus $100. And if it lands on odd, we lose our bet. We also lose our bet if it lands on zero or double zero. In American Roulette, there are 38 pockets, so all the probabilities will be out of 38. In European Roulette, there's only 37 pockets, 18 even pockets, and 18 odd pockets. And then we have one each of the zeros and the double zeros. We multiply this column by this column to get this column. And then we add these to find out the expected value. This is a pretty large difference. You're expected to lose your money almost twice as fast, all because of one little green pocket. The running count isn't enough to make good decisions. If there are a lot of cards remaining to be dealt, then the running count isn't as strong as if there were fewer cards remaining to be dealt. So we make an adjustment with a thing called the true count. We take our running count and we divide by the number of remaining decks. As you're playing, the number of remaining decks is visible to you so you can make estimates on this. Once we have a value for the true count, we can start changing our behavior to take advantage of this information we now know. If the true count that we calculated before is less than or equal to two, you keep betting your minimum bet. But if the true count is greater than two, now you wanna change your bet to take advantage of the probability swinging in your favor. The way to calculate your bet is you do the true count minus one and you multiply that by your minimum bet. And that extra money we're betting is now to take advantage of the probability swinging in our favor. You can do more than just change your bets when things swing in your favor. You can also change your basic strategy. Typically when you have a 16 and the dealer showing a seven, you would hit. But if you know there's a lot of high cards remaining in the deck to be dealt, you might actually stand in this scenario. And there's a lot more examples of this. I hope this was fun. You guys are awesome. 
two to the one to the one to the three versus two to the one to the one to the three. I made a video about a week ago that went over this and a lot of people were confused about how it was solved. So I wanna show the difference between these two. Let's review the one I did in my previous video. This is called a tower. And the key here is that this exponent, this three exponent is the exponent for the one. And this stuff is the exponent for this one. And this stuff is the exponent for this two. So we need to do the exponent for this one first. This one to the three gives us one. So now we have two to the one to the one. And this one here is the exponent for this one. So we calculate one to the one, which is one. And then two to the one is two. And that's how towers work. You work your way down versus this scenario of two to the one to the one to the three. This three is the exponent for all of this stuff, not just the one. You notice how they're all at the same height. Notice how this three is higher than the one. And this one is higher than that one. And this one's higher than that too. That's how you know if something's an exponent of something, it's higher up. But these are all at the same height. In this case, we would do two to the one first, which gives us two. And then we do two to the one again, which is two. And then we do two to the three, which is eight. So I hope this helped clarify. You guys are awesome. Two to the one to the one to the three versus two to the one to the one to the three. I made a video about a week ago that went over this. And a lot of people were confused about how it was solved. So I want to show the difference between these two. Let's review the one I did in my previous video. This is called a tower. And the key here is that this exponent, this three exponent is the exponent for the one. And this stuff is the exponent for this one. And this stuff is the exponent for this two. So we need to do the exponent for this one first. This one to the three gives us one. So now we have two to the one to the one. And this one here is the exponent for this one. So we calculate one to the one, which is one. And then two to the one is two. And that's how towers work. You work your way down versus this scenario of two to the one to the one to the three. This three is the exponent for all of this stuff, not just the one. You notice how they're all at the same height. Notice how this three is higher than the one. And this one is higher than that one. And this one's higher than that too. That's how you know if something's an exponent of something, it's higher up. But these are all at the same height. In this case, we would do two to the one first, which gives us two. And then we do two to the one again, which is two. And then we do two to the three, which is eight. So I hope this helped clarify. You guys are awesome. Why does counting cards work for blackjack, but not other games? Other games at casinos use dice or a roulette table, or they reshuffle the deck between hands. That means every game is independent. One game does not influence the next. If you roll dice and get a three, it has no effect on the probability distribution of the next roll. If a spin on roulette gets a black 15, it has no effect on the probability distribution of the next spin. And when you reshuffle a deck, a previous hand has no effect on the next. So all these games have independence from one game to the next. What's different about blackjack? So blackjack has dependence. They don't reshuffle the deck between each hand. That means whatever cards are played in one game does affect the next game. And we can use this to our advantage. So if we have a way of tracking what's been played, we can start seeing when the probability is in our favor or against us. And when it's in our favor, we can take advantage of that. The dealer has fixed behavior they must follow. If their hand is less than or equal to 16, they must hit. If it's greater than or equal to 17, they must stand. They don't get to change their behavior. This required dealer behavior is part of why counting cards works. These are all the possible cards in a deck. Suit doesn't matter in blackjack, so we're just looking at the values of the cards. Due to this required dealer behavior, the dealer wants more smaller cards in the deck, and they want less of the large cards. Since we're competing against the dealer, we're the exact opposite. Players like the large cards and dislike the small cards. And these middle cards don't do much, so we can ignore them. There's only a finite number of these cards to be dealt. So for each of these smaller cards being dealt, the probability distribution of future hands is becoming better for the player. So we give it a value of plus one. So for each of these larger cards that's dealt, that means the probability distribution of future hands is now going to the dealer's advantage. So we give them a score of minus one. So as cards get dealt, you're going to keep track of the plus ones and the minus ones. And you're going to keep a running count. If a higher proportion of smaller cards is played than higher cards, you're going to start noticing a positive running count. And vice versa, if a lot more larger cards are played, you're going to notice a negative running count. Positive running count is better for the player and a negative running count is better for the dealer. Let's solve two to the one to the one to the three. I had somebody request this. I thought it was an excellent idea. When you have an exponent to an exponent to an exponent, your instincts might be to go from left to right. So do two to the one and then to the one and then to the three, but it actually works like this. You would do the one to the three first and then the one to that and then the two to that. So as we solve this, we do one to the three, which is one. So I'll rewrite this as two to the one to the one. Then we're gonna do this one to the one, which is one. So we have two to the one and then two to the one is two. So the answer of two to the one to the one to the three is two. Comment on what you'd like me to solve for next. You guys are awesome. I'll talk to you soon. Bye. I don't understand how this is possible. Please comment if you know more about this. If I go fast, I think I can fit all the steps of this into a TikTok. Check out this infinite series. If we stop at an odd term, this is equal to one. And if we stop at an even term, this is equal to zero. So let's just take the average of these two numbers. So we'll call this infinite sum one half. Check out this series. Here it is again, but I scooted over one place and stuck a zero in the front. What happens if I add these together? X plus X is two X. One plus zero is one. Negative two plus one is negative one. Three minus two is positive one. Negative four plus three is negative one and so on. This is equal to one half. Divide both sides by two and we get X equals 
one fourth. This infinite sum is one fourth. We don't need this anymore. And let's drag this up. Next, let's subtract these two. One minus zero is zero. Two minus negative two is positive four because the double negative. Three minus three is zero. Four minus negative four is eight and so on. So let's get rid of these zeros. I can factor out a four on this is one plus two plus three plus four. So I'm going to call it a question mark. Subtract one question mark from both sides. So we get three question mark equals negative one fourth. Divide both sides by three and we get question mark equals negative one over 12. Therefore, one plus two plus three plus four going on forever is equal to negative one twelve. Partial fraction decomposition. This is a pretty scary sounding name, but I'll try to explain it. If you remember adding fractions, something like one third plus one half, you would give them a common denominator and then you would add them together and then you would have a single fraction as your answer. So you took what started out as two fractions, a one third plus a one half, and you changed it into one fraction of five six. The idea of partial fraction decomposition is you're working backwards. You're given one fraction and you're gonna split it into two fractions. So this is a simplified version with just numbers, but we're gonna do it with variables. So when we are done with our partial fraction decomposition, we should end up with two fractions that have something, I'm just making these numbers up right now, something like that. That's going to be our answer. So I'll show you how to do it. Step one, you want to factor the bottom. So I factored the common x out of the bottom. Now we know we want two fractions out of this. One of the fractions is going to have the x and the other will have the x plus two as the bottom. And this makes sense because remember earlier we had the one half plus the one third equals five sixths. Notice how the two and three are the six broken out. So you give the denominators the x and the x plus two. Just each piece of your factor gets its own fraction. Now we don't know what the top is, so I'm going to call this an a and call this one a b and we're going to solve for a and b to find out what the tops of those fractions are going to be next step i'm going to get rid of these denominators by multiplying everything by x times x plus two so now i'm multiplying all three terms by x x plus two now this x cancels with this x this x plus two cancels with this x plus two this x cancels with this x and this x plus two cancels with x plus two so you see there's several things that cancel out so there it is rewritten with everything canceled out so then i distribute the a for the next step let's put these two x's next to each other Next, we can factor an x out of these two. Hopefully you can see that a plus b times x is the same thing as ax plus bx. The only way this statement can be true is if this 8 for the x is the same thing as the a plus b, because they're both the number of x's that we have. Similarly, this 10 needs to be the same thing as 2a. It's the only way this whole statement can be true, is if these boxes are equal to each other. So if we set the two green boxes equal to each other, we have 2a equals 10. And we can solve for a, and we get a equals 5. So then we can set the two red boxes equal to each other. We can plug in five for the A, subtract five from both sides, and we get B equals three. So now we solve for A and B. So now if we go back up here to the top to our original fraction that we split up and plug in five for the A and three for the B, that's the answer to the question. We've now rewritten this single fraction as two fractions being added together, and that's partial fraction decomposition. Hope that makes sense. Comment below on what you'd like me to solve for next. I'll talk to you soon. Bye. This is a cool table that shows you your probability of busting on the next card drawn. So this doesn't tell you whether or not you should hit. That decision is made when you're comparing your hand to the dealer's hand, and that gets a little more complicated. I just want to talk about how the probabilities in this table were calculated. On this side, the value of the cards you have in your hand. Could be two cards, could be three cards, could be four cards. It doesn't matter how many cards there are. And this side shows the probability of busting on the next card you're being dealt. What it means to bust is that your hand is greater than 21. You can't bust if you have 11 in your hand. 10 is the largest card you can get, and this won't exceed 21. If you have a 12 in your hand, these are the four cards that can make you bust. In a standard deck, there are four of each of these. 16 cards total that will make you bust. And that's out of 52 total cards in the deck, which is 31%. If you have a 13 in your hand, now nines will also bust you. And there are four nines. Instead of being 16, this is now 20. And that's where the 38% comes from. For each continuing step, we're going to add four more cards that would make you bust. Eights, sevens, sixes, fives, fours, threes, twos. And that is how all these probabilities get calculated. Feel bet is far less complicated than a lot of the other craps bets. It's only a one roll bet. You either win or lose on the next roll. So these are all the possible scenarios for the next roll. If you bet $100, if you roll a 3, 4, 9, 10, or 11, you get a $100 payout on top of the 100 you originally bet. If the next roll is a 5, 6, 7, or 8, you get no payout. You essentially lose the $100 you bet. Typically, 2 and 12 pay double. And we can use this sum of two dice chart to figure out the probability of each of these scenarios. There are 36 total scenarios when rolling two dice. And only one of those scenarios gives you a 2. So the probability 
probability is one out of 36. Two scenarios for three, three scenarios to get a four, four scenarios to get a five, five scenarios to get a six, and so on. So to calculate the expected value, we're going to calculate the net gain loss times the probability and then add up all the values. So I multiply to get all these and then added them to get this. And it comes out to negative $5.56. So the expected value every time you bet $100 on the field is for you to lose $5.56. And you can see the house has an edge every time you bet. What is the probability of getting a blackjack? A blackjack means you get a 21 on the first two cards that you're dealt. There are two ways to get a 21. Your first card can be an ace and your second card can be a 10. I put the 10 in quotes because a 10 jack, queen, or king would all count as a 10 in this. Or your first card's a 10 in quotes and your second card's an ace. What's probably of getting an ace on your first card? Since there are four aces in a deck out of 52 cards, it's four out of 52. And then we multiply that by the probability of getting a 10 after we got that ace. There are four of each of these, so this is going to be 16. And since we've been dealt an ace, this is now 51. We can also do it for this situation. There's 16 out of 52 of getting 10 on the first card, and then there's four out of 51 on getting the ace on the second. Both of these multiply out to 64 over 2,652. When we add them, we get 128 over 2,652, which is 4.83%. So you have a 4.83 chance of getting a blackjack or 21 on the deal. And that's close to one out of every 21 hands. And this is the reason we call the game 21. Just kidding. On a previous video, we calculated the probability of winning on a pass line bet. A pass bet is you betting that the roller is going to win. In a don't pass bet, you're betting that the roller loses. So we'll switch all these wins to losses and all the losses to wins. Probability of winning went to 50.7. So the house obviously doesn't want us to have an edge. If the next roll happens to be a 12, nothing's going to happen. We'll just give you your money back. We're not going to take any. We're not going to give you any. So I pulled the 12 out of here and brought it down here. It's called a push. Since this is really not part of it anymore, that makes this stuff up here here our total sample space. I added up everything that was our sample space. After I took out the 12, these both got messed up. They actually summed to this 0.9722. So the way we can fix it is just divide both of these by 0.9722. By making the 12 a push, the house is now giving themselves an edge again. If you look at these percentages, it looks like don't pass and pass have the same probability. But if we go a couple more decimal points, we can see that there is a difference. But 2998 is greater than 2929. The don't pass has a better probability of winning. If the roll is a 7 or an 11, you win already. If it's a 2, a 3, or a 12, you lose already. But if you roll a 4, 5, 6, 8, 9, or 10, the game continues. If the game continues and you roll a 7, you lose. If the roll is the same number as the first roll, you win. If the roll is something else, you keep going. So let's find the probability of all this. So first, let's talk about rolling a 7 or an 11. There are 8 outcomes that have a 7 or an 11, so the probability is 8 out of 36. Next, you could roll a 2, 3, or 12. You can see this probability is 4 out of 36. Next, you could roll a 4, and this has a probability of 3 out of 36. In the future rolls, if you roll a four before a seven, you win. And if you roll seven before the four, you lose. So what is the probability of getting a four before a seven? We have three fours and six sevens, and nothing else matters. Three out of nine chance of getting a four, and a six out of nine chance of getting a seven before a four. We can do the same calculations for fives or six for eight and nine and 10. So if we sum the wins, we get 0.4929. And if we sum the losses, we get 0.5071. And we have 49.3% chance of winning and a 50.7 chance of losing. Can we increase our probability of winning in roulette? The answer is yes, we can. On a single game, the house has a higher probability of winning. So there is a way for us to increase our probability of winning. The Martingale strategy is you place a bet. If you win, you just start over. And if you lose, you double your bet for the next time. And you keep doubling your bet. If you eventually do win, you're going to win back everything you lost plus your original bet. And this is the only way we can lose using this strategy. We have to lose 10 in a row. The reason we have to stop after 10 rounds, we can't double our bets anymore because the 10,240 exceeds the table limit. This is our probability of losing 10 in a row or 0.16%. We have a 99.84% chance of winning and a 0.16% chance of losing. We have increased our probability of winning. Have we cheated the system? Do casinos know about this? When we win, we get $10. To figure out how much money we will lose, we have to add up all these bets. And the sum of these is 10,230. So that is a lot of money. So the expected value of each game is negative $6.38. 10 in a row does still happen. You have a real risk of a massive loss. You can't cheat the house on roulette. Why are there so many different formulas for volume? These four are prisms and this one's called a cylinder, but they all do the same thing. There's some base that's extended up. This one's a rectangle, a circle, a triangle, a trapezoid, and this one's a regular hexagon. Since they all follow the same idea, it's just some base with a height, they do share a common formula. The volume is equal to the area of base times the height. We have the 
the area of the base of each of these times the height of the figure. So all of these are the same formula. It's just that the area of the base is different. And this is true for all prisms and cylinders. Next, let's talk about pyramids or cones. What makes a pyramid or cone is that they all go to a point. So the volume isn't the same thing as before. It happens to be exactly one third of what it was when it was a prism. Last, we have spheres, which are a globe or a ball. I don't know how to draw it in 3D. And the volume of that is four thirds pi r cubed. You're probably just gonna have to memorize that one. If you like this video, please comment. You are awesome. I'll talk to you soon. Bye. There's a game called roulette. They divide a circle up into 38 pieces. They have the numbers one through 36, a zero and a double zero. Let's say you bet $1 on even. So here are the four possible outcomes, even, odd, zero, or double zero. Between one and 36, there are 18 evens. So we say the probability of getting even is 18 over 38. Same thing for odd. There's one each of the zero and the double zero. So we say one out of 38 for both of those. So now if we bet $1 on even, we will get $2 if we win. Every other scenario, we get $0. And if we subtract the $1 that we originally bet. This is the actual difference in our wallet after playing the game. And now we can find the expected value. 1 times 18 over 38 is 18 over 38. Negative 1 times 18 over 38 is negative 18 over 38. Negative 1 times 1 over 38 is negative 1 38s for both of these. When we add all these up, we get negative 2 over 38. And that's approximately negative 0.053. So the expected value is around negative 0.05 dollars. So this is why casinos love roulette. For every dollar that's bet on even, on average, the casino gets to keep a nickel of that. And this is true for every version of roulette. The house has a small advantage. All three these are equations for the same ellipse. This top one is my preferred form. It's pretty straightforward how to graph it once you have this form. So here are the notes for this form. The center is hk. So we can see my h is 3 and my k would have to be negative 2 because this is a minus here and this one's a plus. So it need to be minus minus 2 to give us that. This is another way to think of it. Y minus negative 2 squared. And then the horizontal radius is the a. That's this guy right here. So my horizontal radius is just 5. And my vertical radius is is just two because it's the B. So now we have all the information we need to graph it. So first we find the center. There's our center, three, negative two. Now horizontal radius is five. So I'm gonna count five to the right and five to the left. And then our vertical radius is two. So from the center, I'm gonna go up two and down two. And then you just connect your dots and you have your ellipse. And that's it, that's how to graph an ellipse. If you wanna try some more problems with ellipses, I have this page on antimath.com. It's got some notes and some other practice problems. There's a link right there. You guys are awesome. I'll talk to you soon, bye. So we're gonna talk about the area of an ellipse. Let's start with the area of a circle because we're familiar with those and those are just perfect ellipses. The area of a circle is pi r squared. So all we would do is find what r is, which is from the center to the edge and then square it. But I wanna have two different r's because the r going that way and the r going that way are the same. And now instead of calling this r squared, let's break it out into r times r. Let's rename each of these r's. Let's call this r1 and this one r2. So now the area of this circle is pi times r1 times r2. Now that we have the two separate r's, the r's don't have to be the same. And that's how we're going to move into an ellipse. And the r's are now two different values. I think this is a neat way to visualize how the area of a circle is a specific case of the area of an ellipse. We can even call them different letters altogether, make one an a and one a b. So this is how we find the area of an ellipse. It's pi times a times b, and a and b are what's shown in the picture. What is this fog three thing? Well, this is red f of g of three. So I'm going to rewrite it as f of g of 3. So first, let's solve inside the parentheses, the g of 3. Well, this is g of x right here. So g of 3 just means we plug a 3 into the x. Bring down the f. Inside of the parentheses, it's now going to be 3 squared minus 1. 3 squared is 9, and 9 minus 1 is 8. So now we have f of 8. For f, we're going to use this function, and f of 8 just means we plug in 8 for the x. So this becomes 2 times 8 minus 4. 2 times 8 is 16 minus 4. The answer is 12. The f of g of 3 is equal to 12. If you want to try more composite functions, I have this page on andymath.com. The link's right there. There's several more practice problems. I hope it helps. You're awesome. I'll talk to you soon. Bye. What is the probability that your house is haunted? 5% of the homes in your town are haunted. If a house is haunted, there's a 60% chance of seeing the ghost. If you see a ghost, you won't buy the house. If you don't see a ghost when you visit a house, you have a 10% chance of buying the house. You bought a house. What is the probability that your house is haunted? So how do we find out what it is? Bayes' theorem. So we need to define A and B to match our problem. A represents haunted and B represents that we bought it. So now we have the formula that we're gonna use. The unconditional probability of it being haunted is 5%. Probability of us buying it if it's not haunted, we have a 10% chance of buying it if we don't see a ghost. And since we have a 60% chance of seeing a ghost, I mean, there's a 40% chance of not seeing the ghost if it's haunted. These two things are the same. 
And these two things are the same. The probability of buying it if it's not haunted, that's 10%. There's a 95% chance of it not being haunted. After we do all the math, it comes out to 2.1%. So there's a 2.1% chance that the house you just bought is haunted. I is the square root of negative one. Square this, these two things cancel, so negative one. I cubed is this I times I squared. I squared is negative one. And then negative one times I is negative I. I to the four, I squared times I squared. I squared is negative one. Negative one times negative one is positive one. Do I to the fifth. I times I to the fourth. I to the fourth is one, we just did that. And I times one is just I. I to the sixth, I squared times I to the fourth. And I to the fourth is one, and I squared is negative one. And negative one times one is negative one. I to the seventh, I cubed times I to the fourth. I to the fourth was one, I cubed is negative I. And negative I times one is negative I. Do I to the eight, I to the four times I to the four. I to the four is one, and one times one is one. You'll notice the pattern I, negative one, negative I, one. I, negative one, negative I, one. I, negative one, negative I, one. For I to the 401, you're going to cycle through these groups of four a hundred times and there will be one left over i i to the 401 is equal to i and you can do this for any whole number what is a conditional probability you're going to know it's conditional probability if it has a line like this or it says the word given so whatever follows your line or your given that is the condition the condition on this first one is frozen that means that anything that isn't frozen we're not even going to consider for the problem no longer exists this is our whole universe there's nothing else around so probability of success is over total there's 30 successes, the 30 apples, and the total is 95. So that's approximately 31.6%. Now let's do our other problem. Probability of frozen given apples. Now apples are our condition, so we can ignore all this stuff. This is our entire universe for this problem. The successes are the frozen. We have 30 frozen. And the total here is 70. And that's roughly 42.9%. So here's some official notes for this. Notice that the condition is what defines the bottom. If we were to use these notes for this problem, we'd get the exact same numbers. One day, somebody was looking at four similar right triangles. He noticed that the ratio of the this over that was the same for all four triangles. And this angle was one thing that they all had in common. He called this angle theta. Then he wanted to get more official with this and that. The this was opposite of his theta, so he changed it to opposite. And the that was adjacent to his theta, so he named those adjacent. He that if the theta was the same, your opposite over adjacent was also the same. And he gave this relationship a name. He called it the tangent. Next, he saw there was a third side of these triangles. These are called the hypotenuse. There are two other relationships going on, opposite over hypotenuse and adjacent over hypotenuse. So we'd name those sine and cosine. So he drew a triangle that had a one degree theta, and he measured the ratios of the sides. Then he made a triangle with two degree theta, and he measured that ratio of sides. And then he repeated this over and over again for so many different degrees and recorded the ratios. And he made a table. So now when you plug in sine 40 into a calculator, it's using that table he created created to tell you the relationship between the opposite over the hypotenuse of the triangle you have in front of you. So why is a negative times a negative a positive? I have a metal recycling business. I sell the metal for money and everything else is garbage that I have to pay to dispose of. Metal makes me $5 per kilogram and garbage costs me $5 per kilogram. For each person that visits my shop, I can put a value to their visit using this equation. So if a customer drops off 10 kilograms of metal, the value per kilogram of metal is positive five. I now have positive 10 more kilograms than I had before. So positive five times positive 10 is 50. So the value of the visit was $50 to me. So another person comes by and steals 10 kilograms of garbage. Let's calculate what this is worth to me. The value per kilogram of garbage is negative five. So I'll put a negative five here. And the fact they're stealing 10 kilograms means that I'm losing 10 kilograms. So there's gonna be a negative 10 there. So if garbage is gonna cost me $5 and they take away 10 from me, they saved me $50. And I'm gonna call that positive $50. So a negative times a negative gave me a positive. So this is just a real life example of how a negative times a negative gives us a positive. But how do we rationalize the denominator? I think it's easier if we rewrite this in rational exponent form. Six on top stays the same, but this five is going to be to a fractional exponent. The bottom of the fraction is whatever the root is. So in this case, it's going to be a three. And the top of the fraction is whatever the exponent is. In this case, it's a one. Now we're trying to get rid of this fractional exponent. I know that if I match the base, whatever exponent I put here will be added to this exponent. One third plus two thirds is just equal to one. So I'm gonna stick this two thirds right there. And whatever I do to the bottom, I have to do to the top. And when I multiply this, top can't be combined, six times five to the two thirds. The bottom just becomes five because the one third plus two thirds just becomes a one. This answer is probably good enough because we no longer have a radical in the denominator, but we could rewrite it this way as well and this five squared can change into a 25. And this is the answer to our question. We've now rationalized the denominator. 
Sam has $100 in his stock. Tuesday, the stock decreases 25% from the day before. Sam is unhappy with this. On Wednesday, the stock increases 25% from the day before. Sam is happy again. Did Sam get all his money back? The answer is no. Wait, what? But it went down 25% and up 25%. Wouldn't that bring him to where he was? It doesn't. Let's talk about this. So Sam has $100. If he loses 25% of it, that means we're gonna multiply by 75% of it. Rewrite that 75% as a 0.75, and this gives us $75. So after the first day, Sam has $75 left. That's why he's unhappy, because he had 100 the day before. On Wednesday, the stock increases 25%, we're gonna multiply by 125%. It's grown 25%. Rewrite that as 1.25. 75 times 1.25 is 93.75. So he went from $100 down to 93. 375. Huh, that's weird. So why is this? We want to rationalize the denominator. We don't want this radical in the denominator. Why is this? All three of these show two examples of the same number. The left side has a radical in the denominator. The right side has had the denominator rationalized. If we look at the first example, the rationalized one looks cleaner. But if we look at the other two, I would not say these look cleaner. So why would we want to do this if it's making it look more confusing? If I got this and a friend of mine got this, we can't tell immediately they're the same number. We needed to come up with a formal way of expressing numbers so that the same number looked the same no matter who was writing it. Here's an example why that's helpful. Let's compare these. 3 root 2 and 4 root 2. Which one is larger? Well, 4 root 2 is larger. We can see that very easily. Which one of these is greater? I can't tell which one's bigger. We can figure it out by rationalizing this and turning it into this, but we don't want to keep doing that all the time. We just want to give this as a formal answer so that we can quickly identify what's larger. 0 to the 0 equals 1. Wait, what? So 0 to the 2 is 0. 0 to the 1 is 0. 0 to the 3 is 0. 0 to the 0 is 1. Why is it 1? Let me try to explain how I think of this. 60 is 2 times 2 times 3 times 4. Five. Now we can express this 60 as 2 squared times 3 to the 1 times 5 to the 1. This 2 right here says we have two twos. This 1 right here says we have 1 3. And this 1 right here says we have 1 5. How many 7s do I have? 0 7s. 0 11s. This 2 squared is really 4. And this 3 to the 1 is a 3. This 5 to the 1 is a 5. This 7 to the 0 is a 1. It would have to be 1. Because if it was anything other than 1, it would no longer be 60. As I'm looking up, up here, how many zeros do I have? I have zero zeros. This also has to be one. And that is how I think of zero to the zero and why it's one is because it means I have zero zeros. Magnitude of a vector. What is a vector? It's telling us we're going a certain direction for a certain length. This vector, negative four, five, go four to the left and go five up. This arrow doesn't mean go on forever. It means stop here. This vector is displacing us from here to here. It doesn't have to start at the origin. All it's saying is move four in this direction and five in this direction. The magnitude Magnitude. How do we find out how long this is? If we completed the right triangle, this length is 4 and this length is 5. And that's based on these two numbers here. We're trying to find this, V magnitude. So this reminds me of Pythagorean theorem. A squared, 4 squared. B squared is 5 squared. And then C is this magnitude of V. 4 squared is 16. 5 squared is 25. 16 plus 25 is 41. Square root both sides. And we get the magnitude of V is equal to root 41. Approximately equal to 6.4. So here are the official notes of magnitude of a vector. We had a two-dimensional vector. So you don't have to draw a triangle every single time. You can just do this. Quadratic formula, we're going to solve for x. a is the coefficient for the x squared, 1. b is the coefficient for the x, which includes that negative, a negative 6. c is 8. x equals negative b, the negative negative 6, plus or minus square root of b squared, the negative 6 squared, minus 4 times the a, which was 1, times the c, which was 8, and this whole thing thing is over 2 times the a. Negative negative 6 is 6 plus or minus square root of negative 6 times negative 6 is 36 minus 4 times 1 times 8 is 32. This is all over 2. 36 minus 32 is 4. Change the square root of 4 into a 2. 6 plus 2 over 2. 6 minus 2 over 2. x equals 4 or x equals 2. If we were to plug in a 4 for these two x's, we would get 0. Or if we plugged in 2 for these two x's, we'd get 0. That's 
pretty cool. A lot of people mix up factors and multiples. I thought it'd be cool to quickly show you all the factors and multiples of the same number. So you could quickly just know the difference between the two things. So the factors of 12. So these are all the numbers that can multiply to give you 12. 1 and 12, 2 and 6, 3 and 4. And 1 times 12 is 12, 2 times 6 is 12, 3 times 4 is 12. Later on, you'll realize you can also do plus or minus for each of these. So plus or minus 1, plus or minus 2, plus or minus 3. The whole idea is it's the things that multiply to give you 12. Now the multiples of 12 are the things that 12 multiplies in 2. So 12, 24, 36, 48, 60, 72, and so on. That list is never going to stop because you can always do 12 times another higher number. So this is the difference between factors and multiples. Hope this helps. You're awesome. I'll talk to you soon. Bye. Andy Matt. Someone requested a video about solving systems of equations and getting no solution. I thought it was an excellent idea. If two variables x and y have a linear relationship with each other, it can be expressed as y equals mx plus b. m is the slope of the line and b is the y-intercept of the line. If you graph two of them at the same time, it's called a system of equations. They may intersect somewhere. This intersection point is the solution to the system of equations. For this one, if we plug in one for the x and three for the y, both of these equations in the system will be true. As long as the m is different in both of your equations, your two lines will intersect. And that's because the slopes are different, so it has to intersect. If the m is the same and the b is different, your two lines will have the same slope and they will not intersect. If we try to solve a system of equations with the m the same and the b different, some funny stuff happens. Here's an example. We get 3 equals 5. Since 3 does not equal 5, we get a contradiction. That means there's no solution or no intersection point. There is no x and y that you can plug into both of these equations to make it true. You guys are awesome. I'll talk to you soon. This is one of my favorite proofs. Exterior angle theorem. The measure of this angle is equal to the sum of the measure of these two angles. I'll just show you the steps of the proof for this. I'm going to introduce a D. Step one. The measure of angle A plus the measure of angle D is equal to 180 degrees. The reason for this is linear pair. The two angles form a straight line. So measure angle C plus measure angle B plus measure angle D equals 180 degrees. And that's because of the triangle angle sum theorem. That's saying if you draw any triangle the three angles inside the triangle are going to add to 180 degrees. Since both of these are equal to 180, I'm going to set them equal to each other. This is substitution. Both sides of this equation have that angle. I'm going to subtract it from both sides. The measure of angle A, measure of angle C, plus the measure of angle B. The reason for this is subtraction property of equality. So no matter what triangle you draw, if you extend one of the sides, the outside angle A will be equal to the sum of the two opposite interior angles. That's pretty cool. How to multiply decimals. There's a lot of different ways to do it. This is the way I do it. I just stack them on top of each other. I want to temporarily get rid of the decimal points. So I count how many times I move them over and I leave a little note for myself. Now I'm going to do this just as if I would do 65 times 35. 5 times 5 is 25. Carry the 2. 5 times 6 is 30 plus the 2 is 32. And now the 0 placeholder because this is 30. Scratch out this 2 so I don't get confused later. Then 3 times 5 is 15. Carry a 1. And 3 times 6 is 18 plus 1 is 19. Now I add these two numbers up. 5 plus 0 is 5. 2 plus 5 is 7. 3 plus 9 is 12. And 1 plus 1 is 2. Now we're still not done. Right now the decimal point's right here. This 3 is telling me to move it back. 3 spots. So the final answer is 2.275. And this is the way I like to do it. If you want to try more of these, I have this page on andymath.com. There's a lot more you can try out. And they all have answers. There's also related pages if you want to try adding and subtracting decimals or dividing decimals. You're awesome. I'll talk to you soon. Bye. Someone requested this. I thought it was a good idea. Since the degree on top is one larger than the degree on bottom, there's going to be a slant asymptote like this. Sketch the function. It approaches the slant asymptote as it goes to infinity and negative infinity. I want to find the equation of this slant asymptote. How do we do that? Long division. Top, bottom. How many times is x going to x squared? x times. x times x is x squared. x times 4 is 4x. We subtract. x squared goes away. 9x minus 4x is 5x. Bring down the 2. How many times is x go into 5x five times. Multiply five times x to get five x and five times four to get 20. Subtract, five x cancel, and two minus 20 is negative 18. This negative 18 is a remainder. So this negative 18 still needs to be divided by the x plus four. As our x goes to infinity, this piece here is going to go to infinity plus four. Negative 18 over infinity plus four, that's zero. This can be ignored. The slant asymptote of this is f of x equals x plus five. You're awesome. I'll talk to you soon.
I. I to the fourth equals one. Wait, what? Well, first, what is I? Let me give you a little bit of a backstory. Square root of four is equal to two. Two times two equals four. Square root of one equals one. One times one equals one. But what is square root of negative one? Negative one times negative one, that's equal to one because the negatives are gonna cancel each other out. One won't work and negative one won't work. We invented something called I. I is an imaginary number. A lot of great stuff comes from this imaginary number. And it's defined as I equals the square root of negative one. Let's just do some algebraic manipulations. Let's square both sides of this equation. Left-hand side stays I squared. The square and the square root cancel each other out. This side is negative one. Now let's square both sides again. I squared times I squared, negative one times negative one. I squared means we have two I's and the other I squared is two I's. Since we have four I's, this ends up being I to the fourth. And then negative one times negative one, that's one. And this is what we have up here. I to the fourth equals one. You guys are awesome. I will talk to you soon. Bye. I apologize on this one. It's got a little trick in it, but by the end of the video, you'll see where I was going. Randomly pick any number between one and 10. What is the probability it is four? There's a 0% probability of you randomly selecting four. What? Before people get upset, let's talk about this. What is probability? The total successful events over the total possible events. How many successful events? There's only one, and that is selecting the number four. Now, what is the total possible events? Looks like there's one out of 10 chance of choosing the four if it's random. That's correct. If I said integer, but I said any number. So that would include 5.718 or 2.2213 or any of these other numbers. Any number you can come up with, you can go as far as you want in the decimals and get a different number altogether. There is no end to how far this can go. So the total possible events is far more than 10. It's infinity. This is equal to zero, which is 0%. So there is a 0% chance that you choose four when you pick any number randomly between one and 10. Zero factorial equals one. So first you might not even know what this factorial means. For example, four factorial, if we had four objects, how many different ways could we arrange them? You do four times three times two times one, 24. After we shift them all around, there's 24 different ways we can arrange them. But what three factorial represents is if we had three objects, how many different ways could we arrange those? Three times two times one is six. Here's the six different ways you can arrange three three objects. Two factorial is how many different ways can we arrange two objects? Two times one, two. You can arrange them this way, or you can arrange them this way. So one factorial, be one, and then we have zero factorial. If we have no objects, how many different ways can we arrange no objects? Well, there's one way to arrange them. That's it, look at my circle. That's how I've arranged zero objects. So this is one explanation for why zero factorial equals one. Let me show you another one. Hey guys, welcome to this video. We're gonna talk about line and rotational symmetry. So line symmetry is how many ways can you cut the figure so that it's a perfect mirror on both sides. This is a line of symmetry. So is this, 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 and also this. All of these cut it in half and it mirrors itself. If we click show line symmetry, you'll see what I just drew, those five lines of symmetry. The rotational symmetry, how many degrees until it rotates on top of itself again? So we can see that if I brought this point here and this point there and so on, it would rotate onto itself. A full rotation would be 360 degrees. We're gonna spin it one fifth of that 360 degrees is 72 degrees. And so this piece right here is 72 degrees. That is the rotational symmetry of this figure. And there it is right there. If you want to try more of these, I put together this page where you can look at more of them. And same thing, you can just click and it'll show you the line symmetry or the rotational symmetry. The link should be visible somewhere, or you can just search for it on the homepage. Zero factorial equals one. You might not even know what this factorial means. So for example, four factorial, do four times three times two times one, 24. Three factorial, three times two times one, six. The two factorial would two times one, two. One factorial be one. Three factorial, is three times two times one. And look at this, we have a three times two times one right there. Change this into a three factorial. Two factorial is two times one. So this two times one, change it to a two factorial. And a pattern is gonna emerge. Whatever this number is, you take that number and you multiply it by the factorial of one less than it. So let's do a couple of these. Four factorial, four times, and then we do one less than it. Three factorial, three, do one less than it. Two factorial, two, and do one less than it. One factorial, one, and we do one one less than it. We know that's one. So we're saying one times zero factorial equals one. So the only way that's true would be if zero factorial is equal to one. 
So this statement's got to be true. An angle is 30 degrees more than its complement. What are complementary and supplementary angles? Complementary angles are any two angles that sum to 90, and supplementary angles are any two angles that sum to 180. Let's write this as an expression. An angle. This is something that we don't know, so I'm going to call it x. It's also what the question's asking about. So once we solve for x, we're done. Is is an equal sign. 30 degrees more than 30 plus, and then its complement. If we knew an angle was 20 degrees and we wanted to find the complement of it, we would do 90 minus 20 to get the 70 for the answer. But in this case, we don't know what the angle is. So that's not a 20 here, it's an x, which means that this is an x. If your angle's x, your complement would be 90 minus x. 30 plus 90 is 120. I can add x to both sides. These two cancel. The x plus x is 2x. Divide both sides by 2, and we get our answer of x equals 60. So that's our answer to the question. You're awesome, and I'll talk to you soon. Bye. So we're going to solve this by completing the square. First step, we want to get this stuff alone on one side. So I'm going to subtract 8 from both sides. Add something that makes the square complete. That's the idea of completing the square. So the thing that goes in the space is b over 2 squared. b in this case is negative 6. So when you divide negative 6 by 2, you get negative 3. And when you square it, you get 9. Whatever we add to that side, we want to add to this side. The reason I wrote the negative 3 down here is because that is what the perfect square is. This x minus 3 squared is the same thing as x squared minus 6x plus 9. Negative 8 plus 9, which is 1. And square root both sides. When you square root, you're left with just x minus 3 because the square root and the square cancel each other out. Anytime you introduce the square root, it's plus or minus. So this is going to be plus or minus 1. Add 3 to both sides, and we end up with x equals 3 plus or minus 1. 3 plus 1, that's 4. And 3 minus 1 is 2. And that's the answer to the question. You're awesome. I'll talk to you soon. What does this add up to? D equals one half plus one fourth plus one eight plus one sixteen plus one thirty two and so on. You keep cutting the number in half each time and you do that forever. So let's take our equation and let's divide it everything by two. So we get D over two equals, so half of one half is one fourth, half of one fourth is one eighth, half of one eighth is one sixteenth, and this goes on forever. So next, using elimination, I'm gonna subtract the second row from the first row. So D D minus D over 2, D over 2. This one fourth, this one eighth, this one sixteenth. These are just going to cancel when I subtract. And this is going to go on forever. But this one half didn't cancel with anything, so it's going to be brought down. It's like one half minus zero. D over 2 equals one half. To solve for D, I'm going to multiply both sides by 2. These cancel, which gives me 1. And these two cancel, so D equals 1. This is called an infinite geometric series. Normally, you wouldn't solve this the way I just did. You would use this stuff, but I wanted to show you this way. Theoretical probability versus experimental experimental probability. What is the difference? Imagine flipping a coin, a fair two-sided coin. Probability of getting a head is 50%, and your probability of getting a tail is also 50%. We assume it's equally weighted. That is the theoretical probability. Now for experimental probability, I flipped a coin a number of times and I recorded it in a table. So here's my table. So I flip a coin and I get a head. I flip a coin, I get a head, then I get a tail, and then a tail, and then another tail, and then a head. And I keep recording my results, tally them all up, toss it a hundred times. I've got heads 54 times and a tails 46 times. Now my experimental probability of getting a heads is 54 out of 100 or 54 percent. So that's my experimental probability. My theoretical probability is still 50 percent. Experimental probability, you use the data from your previous experiment to conclude a probability. So I hope this clarifies the difference between theoretical and experimental probability. You are awesome. I'll talk to you soon. Bye. You guys, we're going to evaluate a piecewise function. So for x equals 7, which of these two is true? What's the top one? Because 7 is greater than 4. We are not going to use this one. This is telling us that we're going to use this function. So f of 7 is equal to, and we're going to plug a 7 into the x. 7 plus 2, and that equals 9. So the answer to this is 9. Had this 7 been something different like a 2, we would have ended up using this lower one, this x squared, because 2 is in this domain. I posted more of these online if you want to try some more. There's a whole bunch of samples. You can do. Well, there's a lot of them. There's a lot of samples you can try, and they all give the answers. It's 21 different ones you can try. Find that page by going to andymath.com. On the home page, just type something like evaluating piecewise functions, and this page will come up. And that's the page I just showed you. Please check it out. I'd love people to use it. You're awesome, and I'll talk to you soon. Bye.
You may have seen this bar before. What it means is that that nine is gonna go on forever. This means the same thing as one. How is this possible? There is a neat way to demonstrate it. We'll say X equals 0 0.9 bar. So I'm gonna rewrite this showing some of the nines that follow. They go on forever. Multiply both sides by 10. X by 10, that's 10 X. If you do 0 0.9999 times 10, moves your decimal place over one spot, 9.99999. I'm gonna rewrite that up here. We have our original x that we assigned and we multiplied it by 10. I can subtract these 10x minus x, 9x's. All of these 9's going on forever are going to cancel each other out when I subtract. 9 minus 0 is 9. Divide both sides by 9 and we get x equals 1. If you remember earlier, I said x equals 0.9 bar. We must conclude that 0.9 bar equals 1. This is just a fun demonstration I wanted to share with you. I hope you liked it. We're going to do some probability involving dice. Two dice are rolled, you sum the face values shown on the dice. You find the probability that the sum is six. So this chart right here is my favorite piece of notes. It gives us every single scenario for rolling two dice. This can be your first roll and this would be your second roll. This is all 36 total possible outcomes and all 36 of those outcomes have the same probability. So we want to know what is the probability that the sum is six. Probability is the total number of successful outcomes divided by the total number of possible outcomes. So we know that there's 36 total outcomes. Now, how many of those are successful? These are all the possible ways to get a six. We have five situations that could be successful. So our probability is five out of 36, which approximately equals 0.13891913.9%. So if you're ever rolling two dice and you want to know what your probability of getting a six is, it's 13.9%. You're awesome. I'll talk to you soon. Bye. Andy math. Going to multiply 23 times 12. There's two ways to do this. I'll show you both ways. The way I originally learned was to just multiply 23 by 12 like this. 2 times 3, which is 6. Then 2 times 2, which is 4. This one right here is technically a 10. So we want to put a 0 placeholder. And we go 1 times 3 is 3. And 1 times 2 is 2. Add these up. 6 plus 0 is 6. 4 plus 3 is 7. And then the 2. So 276 would be the answer. The other method is to make something called a generic rectangle. You express this 23 as a 20 and a 3, and you express this 12 as a 10 and a 2. So next, we just find the area of each of these rectangles by doing base times height. 20 times 10 is 200, 3 times 10 is 30, 2 times 20 is 40, and 2 times 3 is 6. Add up all these numbers. 0 plus 0 plus 0 plus 6 is 6, 0 plus 4 plus 3 is 7, and 2 is just brought down. So both methods give us the same answer, so it's just up to you whichever one you prefer. Intro to limits. As x approaches is zero, what is this going to be equal to? If we were to plug in zero for x directly, we would end up with zero over zero, and that doesn't tell us anything. We can't work with zero over zero. We need to simplify things so that we can plug the zero in. We'll bring the limit down. The top has a greatest common factor of x, so I'm going to factor that out. x times what is x squared? That's x plus, and then x times what is 2x? That's a 2. And on bottom, we still have an x. These x's can cancel each other out. So now it just becomes the limit as x approaches zero of x plus 2. Two. Plug in the 0 for the x, and 0 plus 2 is 2. The limit as x approaches 0 of x squared plus 2x over x is 2. It doesn't mean that it's equal to 2 at 0, because it's not defined at 0, but it approaches 2. As the x gets really close to 0, the y gets really close to 2. If you want to try more of these limits, I have this page on andymath.com with a bunch of sample problems, and they all show their work, and some of them have videos you can watch too. You're awesome. I'll talk to you soon. Bye average rate of change. Problem says find the average rate of change of f of x equals x squared over the interval 2, 5. What is average rate of change? Well, here's some nice notes we can use. It's f of b minus f of a over b minus a, where a is the start of your interval and b is the end of your interval. So in our case, a equals 2 and b equals 5. f of 5 minus f of 2 over 5 minus 2. So what is f of 5? f of x is x squared, so f of 5 means we're going to plug a 5 into the x. 5 squared. And then f of 2 just means we're going to plug a 2 into the x. 5 squared is 25, 2 squared is 4, and 5 minus 2 is 3. 25 minus 4 is 21, 3 still on bottom, and then 21 over 3 is 7. The average rate of change is 7. If you want to try more of these, I have this page on andymath.com. There's several more problems and you can check the work. You can see how it's all solved. You're awesome. I'll talk to you soon. Bye. 
we're going to find the geometric mean of 3 and 12. Here are some notes. There's three ways you can think of it. Super quick way, you literally just do the square root of A times B. An alternate formula kind of explains more of what it is, is A over X equals X over B. So X is the geometric mean of A and B. Another alternate formula is just X squared equals A times B, which then simplifies to this. The one I want to use is X equals root AB. I'll write it down. The geometric mean of 3 and 12. We just follow this note. It's X equals the square root of 3 times 12. 3 times 12 is 36. The square root of 36 is 6. So 6 is the geometric mean of 3 and 12. If we write it 3 over what equals what over 12, if we put a 6 in here, it's correct because 3 over 6 is 1 half and 6 over 12 is 1 half. So that's kind of neat. This all came from this page on andymath.com. There's notes, practice problems. You're awesome. I'll talk to you soon. Bye. Let's find the area of this triangle. The problem here is none of these are right angles, so we don't know what the height of this triangle is. There is an alternate formula if you don't know the height. It's called Heron's formula. Heron's formula. To do Heron's formula, you take the semi-perimeter, which is the perimeter divided by two. You're gonna plug it in there, 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 and there. And then you subtract each of the side lengths from the semi-perimeter, multiply it all, and take the square root. It's a 2,000 year old formula. We're gonna use it for our problem. First step, we find the semi-perimeter. It's 22 divided by two, which is 11. I'm gonna put an 11 for each of the S's. And then I'm gonna plug in each of these sides into these three spots. 11 minus nine is two. 11 minus eight is three. 11 minus five is six. 11 times 2 times 3 times 6 is 396. And the square root of 396 is approximately 19.9. Area of this triangle is 19.9 units squared. If you want to try more of these problems, there's this page on andymath.com. There's several more you can try out. Are you preparing for the SAT? Do you need more practice problems? Andymath.com has nine practice tests, all with 15 questions. They all have answers. And if you're stuck on any of them, you can go through a video watching how it's solved. Nine practice tests, 15 problems. That's 135 problems. I personally made up all these questions based on past SAT questions. You will never see these questions anywhere else. So if you want 135 fresh questions to try, check out andymath.com. From the homepage of andymath.com, it's right here. It's at the very top. Just click on this and there you go. Look at all these awesome questions, all with videos. How helpful. Another cool feature is if you click on this, a lot of the problems have a way to practice more problems. So if you didn't understand how you got the answer, not only can you watch the video, but you can also find more problems that are similar and you can try more problems problems that were just like the one you just did. If you know anybody trying to learn SAT, share this with them. I would love for more people to use it. I'll talk to you soon. Bye. Andy Math. X to the one fourth. What does a fraction mean in an exponent? Anytime you see a fraction, it means we're dealing with roots. And this number in the denominator of the fraction is the number for the root. So this is a fourth root of X. This number, the number on top, it can go there. So the X is to the one power. You can also write it as the fourth root of X and do that whole thing to the one power. Both these mean the same thing as X to the one fourth. Let's look at another one. X to the two thirds. We're going to be dealing with the root. X is inside the root. The number in the denominator of the fraction is our root. And the number in the top is the exponent for the x. We can also rewrite this as the cube root of x, and we can square this whole thing. This two can either go on the inside of the cube root or on the outside of the cube root. This top one's called rational exponent form, and these bottom two are both radical form. Let's look at one more of these. Three to the four fifths, three under a root. It's gonna be a fifth root because of the five that's in the denominator to the power of four, or as a fifth root of three and do the whole thing to the power of four. Hey guys, welcome to this video. We are gonna factor this trinomial. I like to make one of these X's, whatever one times six is I put on top and whatever this middle number is I put on bottom. Now I want two numbers that multiply to six and add to five. So that would be two and three. Draw a two by two box. The X squared from right here, I'm gonna stick right here. The six from here, I'm gonna stick down here. And then this five X, I'm gonna split it up based on the two numbers that I picked here, two X and three. X. Now we fill in the outsides. So X times X is X squared. Then X times what gives me 3X? Well, that's 3. And X times what gives me 2X? That's 2. So this top part is X plus 2. And we want to multiply that X plus 2 times X plus 3. And that's it. X plus 2 times X plus 3 is the answer to the question. That is X squared plus 5X plus 6 factored. Comment below on what you'd like me to solve for next. You're awesome. I'll talk to you soon. Bye. Andy Math. 
factor 3x squared plus 16x plus 5. I set up an x and a box. The first coefficient times the third coefficient goes on top, and the middle coefficient goes on bottom. Two numbers that multiply to 15 and add to 16. 15 times 1 is 15. 15 plus 1 is 16. 3x squared, plug it in here. 5, plug it in the bottom right box. And this 16x in the middle, it gets split up based on the two numbers here. 1x and 15x. So to get a 3x squared, well, I know I'm going to have an x and an x, and I need a 3 on one of those. If I put a 3 here, it's not going to work well with the 1, so I don't want to put it there. I'm going to put it on top because the 3 will work well with the 15. 3x times what gives us 15x? 5. x times what is 1x? 1. Check ourselves. 1 times 5 is 5. On the left, this x and 5 is x plus 5. 3x plus 1 and that's the answer to the question, x plus 5 times 3x plus 1. Factor out the GCF, the greatest common factor. What is the greatest common factor? What number goes into 5, 15, and 10? It's 5. The x squared, the x, and this x squared, x. And same thing for the y. We have 1y, 3y's, and 2y's. So 1y is the biggest that will go into all three of those. 5 times what is 5? 1. x times what is x squared? x. And y times what is y? Well, that's 1, so we don't have to put anything. Plus. 5 times what is 15? 3. x times what is x? 1, so we don't have to put anything. And y times what is y cubed? y squared. Plus. 5 times what is 10? 2. x times what is x squared? It's x. And then y times what is y squared? y. And that is the answer to the question we factored out the GCF. If we were to redistribute this to each of the three terms, it would bring us back to where we started. Comment below on what you'd like me to solve for next. I'll talk to you soon. Bye. Andy Math. You guys, welcome to this video. We're going to find the surface area of this triangular prism. We want to find the area of each of the sides. So we have this triangle in the front, this triangle in the rear, this rectangle at the base, this rectangle on the side. And last, we have this rectangle. So a triangle is one half base times height, and the other triangle is one half base times height. And then rectangles are base times height. Six times eight is 48, divided by two is 24. This one's the same. Five times six is 30. Five times eight is 40. Five times 10 is 50. We add up all these numbers and get 168. And since this is measured in feet, our unit is going to be feet squared because it's an area. So the surface area for this figure is 168 feet squared. Comment below on what you'd like me to solve for next. Check out andymath.com for more math practice. I'll talk to you soon. Bye. Andy math. We're going to talk about adjacent angles. We'll do a couple sample problems. Are angles 1 and 2 adjacent? To be adjacent, we're looking for two things. Do they share a common vertex and do they share a common side? And yes, these two share a common vertex and a common side. So the answer is yes, they are adjacent angles. Number two, angle 1 is this, angle 2 is this. They share a common vertex and they share a common side. So the answer is yes. Number three, no, these are not adjacent. They do share a common side, but they don't share a common vertex. So the answer is no, they are not adjacent adjacent angles. Number four, they share a common vertex and they have a common side. The answer is yes, they are adjacent angles. Number five, these two share a common vertex, but they do not share a common side. So the answer is no. Number six, these once again share a common vertex, but they do not share a common side. The answer is no, they are not adjacent angles. These are actually called vertical angles. Vertical angles. Hopefully those six examples help you understand adjacent angles. This page is from andymath.com. Feel free to check it out. Andy Math. Do you ever just crave math? You want to learn something new? Were you ever confused about something in your class and you want to look it up? Check out andymath.com. Andy Math. There's over a thousand different topics from elementary to calculus. For example, if you're stuck on, say, area of a sector, there's notes that show you how to do the problem. There's sample problems with answers, or you can see the work worked out for you, or you can just watch a video seeing how to do it. And after you learn that one, you can try another one or another one. And same thing, you can see the work, the answers, tons and tons. Look at all those practice problems you can do. There's also related pages at the bottom. And this is just one of thousands of pages. You can also search by class as well. So if you're trying to learn calculus, here's all the calculus pages I have. Here's one on double integrals. Same thing, you can check your work or you can actually see the work being done on how to solve it. And if you want to just search whatever you're working on, just type it in. Addition, fractions, whatever you want, and it'll search for it. If there's anything missing, comment on TikTok or on my YouTube channel, and I'll try to add the content for you. Have a good one. You're awesome. I'll talk to you soon.
Bye. Have you ever wondered what temperature is Celsius and Fahrenheit the same? I'm sure it's something we could just Google, but I want to find out using formulas and math. Here's the equation for the conversion from Celsius to Fahrenheit. We can definitely use this. Uh, okay, I, I know what to do. So we want to know when is this F the same as this C? So I'm going to call them both the same thing. I'll just call them X. I don't like this five in the denominator. So I'm going to get rid of that by multiplying everything by five. Five X, then we have 45 over five X plus and 32 times five is 160. This 45 over 9 simplifies to 9. Now I just need to get the x's together. I'm going to subtract 9x from both sides. Negative 4x equals 160. Divide both sides by negative 4. The left-hand side is just x. The negative 4s cancel. And 160 divided by negative 4 is negative 40. Negative 40 degrees Celsius is the same thing as negative 40 degrees Fahrenheit. That's pretty cool and literally pretty cold. Comment below on what you'd like me to solve for next. I'll talk to you soon. Andy Bath. Hey guys, welcome to this video. I've always found these types of problems to be fun, but if you don't know what you're doing, it's just confusing. But if you do know, it can be fun. This just means we're multiplying this thing times this thing. So we're just gonna multiply all the individual pieces. What is four times six? It's 24. What is M to the third times M to the third? Well, M to the third, that means M times M times M. And then once again, M to the third means M times M times M. So really we have six M's and the same idea for the K to the two and K to the six. This means two K's, this means six K's. So we end up having eight K's in total. And that's the answer to the question. If you want to try more problems like this, I have this page on andymath.com. Andymath. Andymath.com slash multiplying monomials. And it has a whole bunch of these you can try out and they all have answers that you can see and check your work. There's also a whole bunch of related pages on tons and tons of topics. So that's at andymath.com slash multiplying monomials. Feel free to check it out. Comment below on what you'd like me to solve for next. And I'll talk to you soon. Bye adding rational expressions. So this is just like adding fractions, except there's variables involved. You need a common denominator. So we can see right here that X is not the same thing as X plus one. So we're gonna multiply this left-hand side top and bottom by X plus one. And we're gonna multiply this right-hand side top and bottom by X. Now our bottoms are gonna match because the left side bottom is gonna be X times X plus one. And the right-hand side bottom is gonna be X times X plus one. Bring down our plus symbol. Then we need to distribute this four times X is 4x and 4 times 1 is plus 4. And on the right hand side, the 3 gets multiplied by the x to give us 3x. So now we can make it a single fraction where the denominator is the same as the two above and the tops we just add them. So it'll be 4x plus 4 plus this 3x. So it's 7x plus 4 over x times x plus 1. And that's it. That's the answer to the question. Comment below on what you'd like me to solve for next, and I'll talk to you soon. Bye. If you want to try more of these problems, I have this page on andymath.com. Andy Math. Hey guys, welcome to this video. We're going to find the X and Y intercepts. X intercept, where it hits the X axis, the Y value is zero. Three, zero, five, zero, negative two, zero. Notice how all of them have a Y of zero. Similarly, on the Y axis, all of these have an X of zero. Zero, negative four, zero, negative two, zero, five. All of them have an X equal to zero. So in order to find the Y intercept, we set X equal to zero. Then two times zero is zero. So so just y equals four. Four is the y-intercept. But for the x-intercept, we plug in zero for y. Zero equals two x plus four. Minus four from both sides, get two x equals negative four. And then divide by two gives us x equals negative two. The y-intercept was four and the x-intercept was negative two. If you're looking for the y-intercept, just set x equal to zero. And if you're looking for the x-intercept, just set y equal to zero. Comment below on what I should solve for next. I'll talk to you soon. Andy Math. We're gonna solve by substitution. We're looking for two numbers, X and Y, that solve both of these equations. The Y is gonna be the same, so we know these two blue boxes are equal to each other. And we also know because of the equal sign that these two red boxes are equal to each other. I'm gonna plug this X plus five into this Y. Right now we have an X on both sides of the equation, and the way to get it onto only one side is to subtract the smaller one from both sides. So one X minus one X cancels, so we have a five on this side, and 2x minus x is just 1x plus 4. We subtract 4 from both sides and we get x equals 1. Plug in 1 for x into either the bottom one or the top equation. I think the top one's going to be easier. y equals 1 plus 5. So instead of x, I put in 1. And 1 plus 5 is 6. You can either express your answer like these two, where you say x equals 1 and y equals 6, or you'd write it as a point, 1, 6. And that's it. I'll talk to you soon. Bye. Andy Math.
Hey guys, welcome to this video. We're gonna solve for j. We're isolating a variable here. Anytime it says solve for j, the goal is to get this j right here by itself. So everything that's not the j, we just wanna move it to the other side. So I'm gonna subtract 2h from both sides and I'll even add 32 to both sides. I'll do those two things in one step. So on this right-hand side, these cancel and these cancel. So I just have a 3j. And on the left-hand side, we have w minus 2h plus 32. Right now, this three is being multiplied by the j. The way I undo that, that is divide by three. And I'm going to do that to both sides. So my final answer is J equals W minus 2H plus 32 over three. And that's it. That's the answer to the question. Anytime they say solve for a variable and you see a whole bunch of other variables, all they're asking you to do is to get that variable alone. They're not going to expect a number out of you because there's no way you're going to know what the number is. Comment below on what I should solve for next. I'll talk to you soon. Bye. Andy Bath. Hey guys, welcome to this video. We are dividing mixed numbers. First step is to rewrite the mixed numbers as improper fractions. Three times three is nine plus two is 11 thirds. One times five plus one is six. The next step, we want to express this as a multiplication problem. So you leave the first fraction alone and you flip the second. Now that it's a multiplication problem, just multiply across. 11 times five is 55 and three times six is 18. And that's the answer to the question. 55 18ths. And you want to make it a mixed number, you ask yourself, how many times does 18 go into 55? 18 times 3 is 54. Put a 3 in there and we subtract, we have 1 left over. So this 3 is how many whole times 18 goes into 55. So we have 3 holes. And this 1 left over, a remainder is the 1 18th that didn't fit. So that's the other answer to this question. Comment below on what I should solve for next, and I'll talk to you soon. Bye. Andy Bath. So surface area is as if we were painting the whole thing. How much area is that? So we're gonna add up the area of all six sides. So this front side is two by five, so it has an area of 10. And we also have the back side that matches this that we can't see. So we'd say two times this 10. Plus this top is also two by five, so it's also 10. And then we also have the bottom, so we're gonna multiply that by two. Then we have this side here, which is two by two with area of four. And then we have it on the other side over there. So there's two of those. So we have the front and back, top and bottom and the two sides. Two times 10 is 20. Two times 10 is 20. And two times four is eight. 20 plus 20 plus eight is 48. They don't give us a label anywhere. So we can just call this unit squared. And 48 units squared is the answer to the question. If you have any other math questions, check out andymath.com Andy math. or comment below on what you'd like me to do next. I'll talk to you soon. Bye. Hey guys, welcome to this video. Find the length of the red arc. So if we were walking this path right here, this circular path from here to here, we wanna know how far would we end up walking. The entire circle we know is two pi r. That's the circumference of a circle. But we're not gonna walk the whole circle. We're only walking a portion of it. What portion of the whole circle are we walking? Well, the entire circle is 360 degrees and we're gonna be walking 110 of those. So we would say 110 out of 360. We're gonna multiply that by the two pi r, which is the whole circumference and that gives us this piece of it. Now we just plug in values. The R is the radius, which is four. Now we multiply. Two times four is eight times 110 is 880. And then we still have a pi on top divided by 360. And then we can just plug this into a calculator. We get approximately 7.68. And since they didn't give us a length, we would just say units. For more math practice, visit andymath.com Andy or comment below on what you'd like me to solve for next. I'll talk to you soon. Bye. Hey guys, welcome to this summation notation video. Don't let this formula scare you. All it's saying is plug this number into this letter and then add it and then plug in the next number up. So one more than two is three. So then you plug in three and then add it again. And then you're gonna plug in four and you add it again, plug in five, and you stop when you get to this number here. So we're actually gonna stop at plugging in five. So it's telling us to start at this number at the bottom and stop at this number at the top. So we have two, three, four, and five. Now let's plug those numbers in. Plug in two, it's three times two plus, and then we plug in three, which is three times three plus, and then we plug in four, which is three times four, and then we plug in five, which is three times five. Now we just solve these three times two is six, plus three times three, which is nine, plus three times four, which is 12 plus 3 times 5, which is 15. Add all these up, you get 42. And 42 is the answer to the question. Comment below on what you'd like me to solve for next. I'll talk to you soon. Bye. Andy Math. So we want to find the area of this shaded sector. So this is a circle that's been cut up, and we're finding how much area is this shaded stuff. 
So first, what is the area of the entire circle? Well, the area of a circle is pi r squared, but this isn't the entire circle. How much of the circle is this? An entire circle would be 360 degrees, and this is 172 of those 360 degrees. So we're just gonna multiply these two things by each other. Now we still need to plug in for r, for the pi r squared, and this is the r, the 10 is the radius. 10 squared is 100 times pi, times the 172 over 360. So now if we plug this into a calculator, we get approximately 150.1. And they don't give us a unit, so we can say units squared, because they don't tell us feet or inches or anything like that. And that's the answer to the question. Comment below on what I should solve for next. I'll talk to you soon. Bye. Andy math. Evaluate 2x minus 4y if x equals negative 1 and y equals 8. So first I want to point out that this right here says Andy, the and y, that's Andy, as in Andy math. Andy math. And then after you identify that that says Andy, plug in negative one for the x. So I'll say two with the negative one plugged in, minus four, and then we're gonna plug in eight for the y. Then two times negative one is negative two, and then minus, and then four times eight is 32. And then negative two minus 32, well, that's like starting in the hole too deep and going 32 deeper. So you're now negative 34 deeper into the hole. And that's the answer to the question. Comment below on what I should solve for next, and I'll talk to you soon. Bye. Andy Math. Hey guys, welcome to this matrix video. We're adding these matrices. We call this a three by three matrix because it's three rows by three columns. And this one here is also a three by three. Since they are the same size, we can add them together. When we add them together, we get a new three by three matrix. Now to make our new three by three matrix, this upper left number will add to this upper left number. And one plus eight is nine. And then we do the same thing for all the rest of them. The corresponding numbers will add two plus seven is nine. Three plus six is nine. Four plus five is nine. Five plus four is nine. Six plus three is nine. Seven plus two is nine. Eight plus one is nine. And nine plus zero is nine. So our new matrix is a three by three matrix of all nines. And that's how you add matrices. Comment below on what you'd like me to solve for next. And I'll talk to you soon. Bye. Andy Math. Hey guys, welcome to this logarithm video. So it says solve for x, and it's log base four of x equals two. So the way I solve these, I call it loop-de-loop. -loop. You would just do four to the two equals this. So it becomes four squared equals x. All logarithmic equations can be rewritten this way, and it's called exponential form. Now what is four squared? It's 16. And that's the answer to the question. So you probably don't fully understand what's going on here. So I'll start making more log videos over time, but that's how to solve this one is you just make the loop. It changes into four squared equals X and 16 equals X. Comment below if you'd like me to make more log videos. And if you have any other math questions you want me to solve, I'll talk to you guys soon. Bye. Andy math. Hey guys, welcome to this factor by grouping video. So first we split them into two separate groups. We have an x cubed plus two x squared and a minus five x minus 10. Out of each group, we wanna pull the greatest common factor between the two terms. So I can pull an x squared out of this. x squared times what gives me x cubed? Well, that's x, because x squared times x is x cubed. Plus, and then x squared times what is two x squared? Well, that's two, because x squared times two is two x squared. And then we'll do the same thing over here, negative five x and negative 10, well, they both have a negative five in common. So negative five times what gives me negative five X? Well, that's X. And negative five times what gives me negative 10? It's positive two, because negative five times two is negative 10. Both of these share a common term of X plus two. So we're gonna pull out that X plus two, and this remaining stuff is the other factor. And that's the answer to the question. Let me know if you have any questions about this and comment below on what you'd like me to solve for next. I'll talk to you soon. Bye. Andy Math. Hey guys, welcome to this video. We're gonna solve for x. First step is we wanna distribute this four to both of these terms. Four times x is four x, four times one is four, plus. And then we wanna distribute this two to both of these terms. Two times three x is six x, and two times one is two, and it's still equal to 16. Now we combine like terms. This four x and this plus six x become 10 x, and this plus four and this plus two become six, and it's still equal to 16. Now subtract six from both sides. This cancels. We end up with 10x equals 10. Then we divide both sides by 10 and we get the answer of x equals one. Comment below on what you'd like me to solve for next and I'll talk to you guys soon. Bye. Andy Math. Hey guys, welcome to this video. We're gonna simplify the square root of 75. The way we simplify this is make a factor tree. Let's break 75 into two different factors. 
Well, I know this is three times 25. You can think of three quarters as 75 cents. And then 25 breaks down into five times five. And now these are broken down all the way to their primes. So I can rewrite square root of 75 as the square root of three times five times five. Since it's a square root, I'm looking for groups of two. So these two fives get to leave because there's two of them and they become a single five on the outside. So this becomes five. This remaining three doesn't have anything else that can come out. So it's stuck on the inside. And that's the answer to the question. So square root of 75 is the same thing as five square root of three. Comment below on what you'd like me to solve for next. I'll talk to you soon. Bye. Andy Math. Hey guys, welcome to this video. We're gonna find the mean, the median, and the mode. First, for the mean, you add all these numbers up and then divide by however many numbers you have. These all add up to 42. I have one, two, three, four, five, six numbers, so I'm gonna divide by six, and 42 divided by six is seven. So seven is the mean of this data set. To get the median, you list them all in order from smallest to largest, and then find the number that's in the middle. I'm gonna switch this eight and this five. Then I'm gonna start crossing out endpoints until I get into the middle. If there's ever two numbers in the middle, it's the average of those two numbers. So five plus eight divided by two, so 13 over two, which is 6.5. That is my median. So the mode is the most common. Well, if we look here, which number is the most common? Well, we have two twos and just one of everything else. So the mode in this set is two. So that is the mean, median, and mode of this data set. Comment below if you have any more questions about this or whatever you'd like me to solve for next. I'll talk to you soon. Bye. Andy Math. Hey guys, welcome to this video. We're going to be comparing these fractions, five eighths and three fifths. Eighths and fifths are two very different units of measurement. So we want to compare them by giving them a common denominator. Eight and five both go into 40. So I'm going to multiply top and bottom of this side by five and top and bottom of this side by eight. The reason you multiply top and bottom by the same number is you don't want to change the fraction. Five times five is 25, five times eight is 40, three times eight is 24, and five times eight is 40. Now we're comparing 25 fortieths and 24 fortieths. Well, this is pretty easy to see. 25 fortieths is larger than 24 fortieths. Now that's really close. They're only one fortieth apart. So this would have been really hard to draw a sketch comparing these. So we definitely did the best method, just find a common denominator. Comment below if you have any questions about this or if there's any other math problems you want me to do. I'll talk to you guys soon. Bye. Andy math. Hey guys, welcome to this video. We are solving for x. So we want to know what value of x would we plug in to make this proportion true. Guessing and checking is going to take forever, so I'm going to cross multiply. To cross multiply, I say 2 times this 3x minus 1, and I can set that equal to five times the eight. So this process is called cross multiply. Next, I distribute this two to both terms. So two times three X is six X and two times negative one is minus two. And then five times eight is 40. Next step is add two to both sides. The left-hand side is just six X and the right-hand side is now 42. Last step is to divide by six and we end up with X equals seven. And that's the answer to the question. Comment below on what you'd like me to solve for next and I'll talk to you soon. Bye. Andy math. Hey guys, welcome to this video. We're gonna solve for X. So we have four X's here and two X's here, but we can combine those into six X. And then this plus six and this plus one can be combined to be plus seven. And then all that is still equal to 37. Now we wanna get X by itself. We'll subtract seven from both sides. That gives us six X equals 30. And then we divide both sides by six and we get X equals five. And that's the answer to the question. We have now solved for X. Comment below on what I should solve for next. And I'll talk to you soon. Bye. Andy Math. Hey guys, welcome to this video. It's multiply x plus two times x minus five. We wanna make sure that the x and the two go to both the x and the minus five. One way to do that is called FOIL, x times the x, which is x squared, the x times the negative five, which is minus five x, the two times the x, which is two x, and the two times the negative five, which is negative 10. And then we combine like terms. This is x squared, negative five x, and plus two x is negative three x and then we just bring down the minus 10. Let me show you one other way to do it. We can make a two by two box. On the left side, we put the X and the plus two, and on the top, we put the X and a minus five. X by X is X squared. Negative five by X is negative five X. Two by X is two X. Two by negative five is negative 10. X squared, negative five X plus two X is negative three X. Bring out the negative 10. And it gives us the same answer we got before. Comment below on what I should solve next. I'll talk to you soon. Bye. Andy Math. 
So it says f of x equals x squared and g of x equals x plus 4. What is f of g of x? Step one, I like to write it a different way. f of g of x. Find it easier to solve it when it's written this way. So first, what is g of x? Well, g of x is x plus 4. So I'm going to plug that in here for the g of x. What does that mean, f of x plus 4? Well, it's telling us to look at the f function and then plug x plus 4 into that x spot x plus four, and then we're gonna square it. So this might actually be a good enough answer, but we can go further. Anytime you square a binomial, you literally write the thing twice. So x times x is x squared, x times four is four x, then four times x is another four x, and then four times four is 16. And if we combine like terms, we get x squared plus eight x plus 16. And that's the answer to the question. Comment below on what I should solve next, and I'll talk to you soon, bye. Andy Bath. Hey guys, welcome to this even and odd functions video. So the question is asking, is this graph even, odd, or neither? So the way you do these with graphs, an even function is symmetric over the y-axis. So it looks something like that or like this, or something that reflects over the y-axis. So if this were even, it would look something like this instead for this blue part, because it would reflect over the y-axis. So we know right away this is not even. The idea of odd is that it reflects over the origin. So if you have a point here, you would also have a point here. If you have a point here, you would also have a point here. If you imagine jumping to the origin and then jumping again, you would land on that point. From here, if I jump to the origin and then jump again, oh, I do land on a point. From here, if I jump to the origin and jump again, do land on a point. Because it is symmetric about the origin, this is an odd function. Comment below if you have any other questions about this or any other math questions, and I'll try to answer them. I'll talk to you soon. Bye. Andy Math. Welcome to this vertical asymptote video. Identify the vertical asymptotes, 5 over x squared minus 4. Vertical asymptotes occur whenever the denominator is 0 after you've canceled. So here, nothing will cancel, but we just need to know when is the bottom 0. So there's two ways to solve this. One, we can factor the left, which is a difference of two squares. So it'd be x plus 2 times x minus 2. Either x plus 2 equals 0 or x minus 2 equals 0. We subtract 2 from both sides or we add 2 to both sides and we get x equals negative 2 or positive 2. So these are the vertical asymptotes. I'll show you the other way over here. You can add 4 to both sides. x squared equals 4. Then you square root both sides. x equals plus or minus root 4. And that is plus or minus 2. So both these are right. Comment below if you have any questions about this or if there's anything else you want me to solve. I'll talk to you soon. Bye. Andy Bath. Hey guys, welcome to this functions video. Let f of x equal 5x plus 3 and g of x equal 3x plus 5. Find f plus g of 3. So what does this mean? Well, you can think of that as f of 3 plus g of 3. So to do f of 3, we take the f function and we plug 3 in for the x. So it's going to be 5 times 3 plus 3 plus g of 3 means we look at the g function and we plug in 3, 4, x. So this will be 3 times 3 plus 5. Now we can just simplify each of these. 5 times 3 is 15 plus 3, and 3 times 3 is 9 plus the 5. 15 plus 3 is 18 plus, and 9 plus 5 is 14. 18 plus 14 equals 32, and that's our answer to the question. f plus g of 3 is equal to 32. Comment below on what math problem you'd like me to solve next. I'll talk to you soon. Andy Math. Welcome to this video on functions. It says use the graph to evaluate the function. The function here says f of negative 1. So the way to evaluate functions given a graph is you find the number inside here on your horizontal axis. That's going to be your independent variable. And you find out where is it located. And we can see right here that this point right here is 3 high. We want to know how high it is at that negative 1. So the answer for f of negative 1 is 3. So very quickly, if we were asked, what is f of 3? Well, f of 3 is 2. And that's how to do these. Just find out how tall it is on the y-axis at that point. If you have any math questions, comment below, and I will try to get to it. I'll talk to you soon. Bye. Andy Bath. Welcome to this functions video. Let f of x equal 5x plus 3, comma, g of x equal 3x plus 5. What is f minus g of x? We can rewrite f minus g of x as f of x minus g of x. So f of x is 5x plus 3 minus, and g of x is 3x plus 5. 
I'm going to put parentheses around that 3x plus 5 because I want this negative to distribute to both terms in the second function. Next step, I'm just going to bring this down 5x plus 3 minus, and now it's going to be minus 3x and then minus 5 because the negative times the plus 5 is minus 5. Then we combine like terms. 5x minus 3x is 2x, and then 3 and negative 5 gives us negative 2. So 2x minus 2 is the answer to the question. f minus g of x is equal to 2x minus 2. Comment below on what I should do next. And I'll talk to you soon. Bye. Andy Math. Hey guys, welcome to this functions video. It says let f of x equal 5x plus 3. Find f of 3. So the f here is referring to the f here. And notice how there's an x here, but there's a 3 here. Since this x says there's an x right there, you're now going to put a 3 where there once was an x. So it's 5 times 3 plus 3. 5 times 3 is 15 plus 3, and 15 plus 3 is 18. So the answer to f of 3 is 18, and this is why. We just plugged in the 3 for the x, and that's how to evaluate functions. Comment below on what you would like me to solve next, and I will talk to you soon. Bye. Andy Math. Hey guys, welcome to this video. Using vertical angles to solve for x. Since these are vertical angles, we know they are equal to each other. So we can set the two measurements equal to each other. 2x plus 15 equals x plus 30. Now we solve for x. There's an x on both sides of the equation, so we should move the smaller one over. We do that by subtracting x from both sides. 2x minus x is x, and x minus x goes away, so we end up with x plus 15 equals 30. So we want to subtract 15 from both sides. The left-hand side is x, and the right-hand side is 30 minus 15, which is 15. And that's the answer to the question, x equals 15. For more math help, please visit andymath.com. Andy Math. How to multiply the cube root of 2 times the cube root of 4. Step 1, write them both under a single cube root. Step 2, break them down into primes. Since it's a cube root, we're looking for sets of 3. We have three 2s, so those 2s can come out. And there's nothing left on the inside after those 2s leave, so the answer is 2. So this is equal to 2, and there's the work. For more math videos, please visit andymath.com. Andy Math. I'll talk to you guys soon. Bye. So we want to solve for x in this isosceles triangle. In an isosceles triangle, these base angles are equal, and so are these two sides. Since these two sides are equal, we can just say 3x plus 5 is equal to 5x plus 1. And now we just solve for x. There's an x on both sides of this equation, so I'm going to subtract the smaller one over to the other side. 3x is cancel, so we just have a 5 on the left, and 5x minus 3x is 2x. Then we want to subtract 1 from both sides, and then we divide both sides by 2. 4 divided by 2 is 2, and 2x divided by 2 is x. So x equals 2 is the answer to the question. Comment below for what you'd like me to solve next, and I'll talk to you guys soon. Bye. Andy Math. Hey guys, so in this triangle, we want to list the angles from the smallest to the largest, and all they gave us was the side lengths. There's a theorem that tells us that the smallest angle will be opposite the smallest side, so since 5 is the smallest side, we know that angle E is the smallest angle. The same theorem says that the middle angle is opposite the middle side. So this 8 is the middle side. So that means C is going to be the middle sized angle. And then the largest angle is opposite the largest side. So that means angle J, which is opposite the largest side. So this is the order of the angles from smallest to largest. Comment below for which type of math problem you'd like me to solve next. And I'll talk to you guys soon. Hey guys, welcome to this probability question. You flip a coin two times, what is the probability you get two heads? The best way to do this is to show all the possible outcomes. We're gonna flip the coin twice, so we have our first toss and our second toss. So our first toss can be a head, and our second toss can be a head. Or our first toss could be a head, and our second toss could be a tail. Our first toss could be a tail, and the second could be a head. Or the first toss could be a tail, and the second could be a tail. This should represent all possible outcomes. Each of these has an equal probability of happening, so there's a one in four chance so now, what is the probability of getting two heads? Well, this is the one scenario where we get two heads. So the answer is one fourth. As a percent, that would be 25%. And that's the answer to the question. If you flip a coin twice, the probability of you getting two heads in a row is 25%. Comment below on what you'd like me to solve next, and I'll talk to you soon. Bye. Andy Math. How do we solve for x in this right triangle? We're going to use Pythagorean theorem. Pythagorean theorem says a squared plus b squared equals c squared. a and b are the two smaller sides, and c would be the largest side. So to plug in the values, we get 3 squared plus 4 squared equals c squared. 3 squared is 3 times 3, which is 9. 4 squared is 4 times 4, 
which is 16, and we'll leave c squared as c squared. 9 plus 16 is 25, and that still equals c squared. And then to solve for c, we will square root both sides. Square root of 25 is 5, so we get c equals 5. And that's the answer to the question. For more math videos, please check out andymath.com. Have a good one. I'll talk to you soon. Bye. Andy math. How to simplify the square root of 32 over the square root of 2. Step 1, you can rewrite them under a single root. Step 2, we can simplify 32 over 2 to give us 16. And last step, square root of 16 is 4. So the square root of 32 over the square root of 2 is equal to 4. For more math help, visit antimath.com. Andy hey guys, so we want to find the midpoint between these two points, 2, 8, and 4, 8. So we'll use the midpoint formula to do this. So the midpoint formula says that the midpoint is x1 plus x2 divided by 2 comma y1 plus y2 divided by 2. The 2 is our x1, the 8 is our y1, the 4 is our x2, and the 8 is our y2. So we're just going to plug each of these into the formula. x1 is 2, x2 is 4, and we divide by 2. y1 is 8, y2 is 8, and we divide by 2. 2 plus 4 is 6 divided by 2, and 8 plus 8 is 16 divided by 2. 6 divided by 2 is 3, and 16 divided by 2 is 8. So the point 3, 8 is the midpoint of the points 2, 8 and 4, 8. If we sketch a graph that makes sense, 2, 8 is right there, 4, 8 is right there, so 3, 8 is the point that's in between them. Comment below on what you'd like me to solve for next, and I'll talk to you soon. Bye. Andy Math. So we want to solve for x in this triangle. We're going to use the exterior angle theorem. So if we call this A, this B, and this C, it is always true that A will equal B plus C. And these are the two angles that are opposite of this one. So let's fill in for A, B, and C. A was 3x plus 2, B is x plus 25, and C is x plus 17. I put the parentheses there so we could see each of the angles. x plus x is 2x, and 25 plus 17 is 42. So we have an x on both sides of the equation. We want to subtract the smaller one over to the other side. 3x minus 2x is x, bring down the 2. 2x minus 2x goes away, so we just have a 42 on this side. So subtract 2 from both sides. 42 minus 2 is 40 for the right-hand side. And that's the answer to the question, x equals 40. So we use the exterior angles theorem to solve this. Comment on this video for what you'd like me to solve next, and I'll talk to you guys soon. Bye. Andy Math. So we have a stem and leaf plot right here, and the question is asking how many data points have a value of 54. If you don't know how to read a stem and leaf plot, this is a very confusing question. But if you do know how to read it, it's not too bad. This 9 right here represents the number 49. There's this 4 represents the 40 place, and then we have the 9 right there. So instead of writing 49, they just put a 9 there in the 4 row, which makes it a 49. So this 7 then would be 57. This 4 right here represents 74. That's how stem and leaf plots work. So now looking at this question, how many data points have a value of 54? Well, we'll go to the row of the 50s, and I see two fours in here. So each of these fours represents 54. So the answer is there are two data points that have a value of 54. So if this intro to stem and leaf plots makes sense, comment below on what you'd like me to do next, and I'll talk to you soon. Bye. Andy Math. Hey guys, welcome to this video. What are factorials? Well, factorial is that little exclamation point that you see after a number. It's used a lot in probability problems. All it's telling you to do is take the number that you have, so in this case of 4, then go times 3, times 2, times 1. And you just keep going down and stop when you get to 1. 4 times 3 is 12, times 2 is 24. So the answer to 4 factorial, 4 exclamation point, which you say 4 factorial, equals 24. And that's how factorials work. Comment below if you have any other math questions. I'll try to answer them. I'll talk to you soon. Bye. Andy Math. Hey guys, welcome to this video. So we're going to simplify this rational expression, x squared minus 1 over x minus 1. First step, we want to factor the top and the bottom, factor the numerator and the denominator as fully as we can. x squared minus 1, this is a difference of two squares, a squared minus b squared, that's equal to a plus b, a minus b. So that's what we're going to do on the top. x squared minus 1 changes into x plus 1, x minus 1. And then on bottom, we have an x minus 1, and that doesn't factor any further. Now for the next step, we just want to cancel any terms that will cancel. Well, these x minus 1s cancel. We're left with just an x plus 1 on top. Since we canceled out x minus 1, we also want to say x can't equal 1. Because if x did equal 1, then we would have a 0 in the denominator. Even though we canceled it out, it still exists in the original problem. So we need to say x can't equal 1. Comment below on what you'd like me to solve for next. I'll talk to you soon. Bye. Andy Math. 
Hey guys, so we're gonna solve a direct variation. Y varies directly with X. When X equals five, Y equals 15. What is Y when X equals three? First step, we gotta write an equation. Y varies directly with X. Y equals some constant K times X. So we just write Y equals KX. Next, we need to solve for K. Plug in five for X and 15 for Y. Divide both sides by five. So 15 divided by five is three, so K equals three. So now I'm gonna rewrite our equation, but I'm gonna plug in the three for the K. Now they want to know what is y when x is 3. I'm going to plug in 3 for the x and find out what y is. So y equals 3 and then 3 for the x. 3 times 3 is 9. So the answer is y equals 9 when x is 3. And that's it. That's how to do these direct variation problems. Comment below on what you'd like me to do next, and I'll talk to you soon. Bye. Andy Bath. Welcome to this video on factorials. So how do we solve this 19 factorial over 18 factorial? You do this number 19 times 18 times 17, and you keep doing that all the way down till you get to one. And for this 18, we're gonna go 18 times 17 times 16, all the way down to one. These 18s on top and bottom will cancel. The 17s will cancel. This would have a 16 here. It would cancel. Since they're both going down to one, it's gonna cancel all the way down to one. So all that remains is this 19. So the answer to this this is 19. So it's kind of a fun problem. Another way you can write it out is think of 19 factorial as 19 times 18 factorial. So instead of writing out all these numbers down to 18, we're just going to write it as 18 factorial. We have an 18 factorial on bottom. Those can cancel just like they canceled up here. So once again, we get the answer is 19. Comment below if you have any other questions in math. I'll try to get to them. I'll talk to you soon. Bye. Andy math. How to simplify four ninths to the negative one half. Step one, let's get rid of this negative. So we're just gonna take the reciprocal of the inside. We can rewrite that as 9 fourths to the positive 1 half. Now that negative's gone. Step two, let's distribute that 1 half to both terms. So that would be 9 to the 1 half over 4 to the 1 half. A 1 half exponent means the square root, so we can rewrite this as square root of 9 over square root of 4. And square root of 9 is 3, and square root of 4 is 2. And that's the answer to the question. So 4 ninths to the negative 1 half is the same thing as 3 over 2. For more math help, please visit andymath.com. Talk to you guys soon. Bye. Andy math. How to solve for x using the triangle mid-segment theorem. So what the triangle mid-segment theorem says is that this bottom one is twice as big as this one. So we want to express that statement as a mathematical equation. So we'll say 5x minus 2 is, is an equal sign, twice as big as 14. So we literally just said this side is twice as big as this side, and we wrote it as a mathematical equation. Now we can solve this. 2 times 14 is 28, and we can bring down the 5x minus 2. Now we want to solve for x. First, got to get rid of this 2, so we're going to add 2 to both sides. 28 plus 2 is 30. Now 5 is being multiplied by x, so we want to divide both sides by 5. So 5x divided by 5 is just x, and 30 divided by 5 is 6. So now we solve for x using the triangle mid-segment theorem. Comment below for what you want me to solve for next. I'll talk to you later. Andy Math. Hey guys, so we want to list the side lengths from shortest to longest. But first, we need to find out how big this angle is right here. So all three angles add up to 180. 59 plus 58 is 117. And then we'll subtract 117 from both sides. 180 minus 117 is 63. Now we're ready to answer the question. List the side lengths from shortest to longest. Well, the shortest side length is going to be opposite the smallest angle. So the smallest angle is 58 degrees. So the side opposite of it is AC. That side is the smallest. Well, the next biggest angle is 59. So the side opposite of it is AB. And then the largest side is the one that remains, but it's also the one opposite the largest angle. So it's CB. And that's the answer to the question. That's the list of the side lengths from shortest to longest, AC, AB, and CB. Comment on what you'd like me to solve for next, and I'll talk to you soon. Bye. Andy Bath. So to find the cube root of 54, since 54 is not a perfect cube, we want to make a factor tree. 54 breaks into 27 times 2, 27 breaks into 9 times 3, and the 9 breaks into 3 times 3. Then we should circle the primes, Then we can rewrite the cube root of 54 as the cube root of 2 times 3 times 3 times 3. Since it's a cube root, we're looking for groups of 3. We have three threes, so they can be pulled out, and the 2 is left on the inside. And this is the answer to the question. So 3 cube root of 2 is the cube root of 54 simplified. That's it. And this has been your AndyMath.com moment. Andy Math.
You guys, welcome to this video. We're going to simplify this complex fraction. This fraction is being divided by this fraction. So now I just rewrote the same thing, but I made it a division problem. When you're dividing fractions, it's the same thing as multiplying by the reciprocal of the second fraction. So when multiplying fractions, you just multiply across on the top and multiply across on the bottom. 4 times 8 is 32. x cubed times y is x cubed y. Now the 2y times x squared, I'm going to write that as 2x squared y. So now we can simplify this. 32 divided divided by 2 is 16. x cubed divided by x squared, that leaves 1 on top. And then these y's just cancel. So the final answer to this is 16x. Technically, your x can't equal 0 because it's in a denominator here. And also y can't equal 0 because it's in a denominator here and here. But most time, you're fine just saying 16x. Comment below on whatever you'd like me to solve next, and I'll talk to you soon. Bye. Andy math. Hey guys, welcome to this Venn Diagrams video. So we have a really nice Venn diagram here. We have red and trucks. So this 20 right here means we have 20 red trucks. We have 45 red non-trucks. We have 60 non-red trucks. So these are 60 trucks that are not red because they're outside of the red circle. And then we have 25 things that are neither trucks nor red. So what is the probability of us getting a red item? So the probability would be red items over total items. So how many red items do we have? Well, we have the 45 red non-trucks and the 20 red trucks. 45 plus 20 is 65. Then how many do we have in total? Well, we have these original 65 we had here, plus this 60 plus this 25, which is 150. So reduce it into 13 over 30, write it as a percent, which would be 43.3 bar percent, or 43 and a third percent. So I hope this all makes sense. Comment below if you have any other math questions. I'll try to get to them. I'll talk to you soon. Bye. Andy Math. Hey, how's it going? We're going to state the domain of this rational expression. The whole idea of a domain is what are all the possible x values? We can't have zero in the denominator. We have to say that this bottom, this x squared plus 3x plus 2, cannot equal zero. The best way to find the values of x that would cause zero is to factor this left-hand side. So to factor this, we're looking for two numbers that multiply to 2 and add to 3 and that would be one and two. For more factoring practice, visit andymath.com and type in factor. Next step is each of these two pieces cannot equal zero. So we'd say x plus one cannot equal zero or x plus two cannot equal zero. And now we can solve by subtracting one from both sides or subtracting two from both sides. So the domain for this rational expression is that x can't equal negative two or negative one. Comment below on what you'd like me to solve next. I'll talk to you soon. Bye. Andy Math. How to solve for x with equilateral triangles. Since all three sides of this triangle are equal to each other, we can set these two measurements equal to each other. So now we have an equation to solve for x. We have an x on both sides, so we want to move this smaller x over to the other side. So I'm going to subtract 8x from both sides. 10x minus 8x is 2x. 8x minus 8x cancels, so we just have a 15 on this side, and we bring down the 45. Now our goal is still to get x by itself, so we're going to add 45 to both sides. 15 plus 45 is 60, and we have 2x on the left side. Last step is to divide by 2, and we end up with x equals 30. And that's the answer to the question. For more math videos, please check out andymath.com. Andy math. Hey guys, welcome to this video. We're going to be doing adding and subtracting cube roots. So for number 1, this says 3 cube root of 5 plus 6 cube root of 5. Well, if you think of a cube root as, say, a cookie, so this would be 3 cookies plus six cookies, well, we know that's nine cookies, or in other words, nine cube root five. So same idea with number two here, seven cube root three minus three cube root three. So just think of a cube root of three as an object. So we have seven of those objects minus three of those objects. We're left with four of those objects, and that object is the cube root of three. Four cube root of three. We'll do another one. 5 cube root of 7 plus 6 cube root of 7. Once again, these cube roots of 7s, these are just things. So we have 6 cube roots of 7 here and 5 cube roots of 7 here. When we add them together, we're now going to have 11 of those blue boxes. And those blue boxes were cube roots of 7. So the answer is 11 cube root of 7. And if we check it, there it is. And then you start to get a little bit trickier with something like number 4 because it's three cube root of two minus seven cube root of two, but that's just gonna be negative numbers because we're still dealing with cube roots of two and cube roots of two. So three minus seven is negative four and the object is still a cube root of two. 
and we can check this answer. And we get negative four cube root of two. Now for number five, the only trick here is there's three of them. But all this says is we have two cube roots of five plus three cube roots of five plus four cube roots of five. Well, two plus three is five plus four is nine. So the answer is gonna be nine cube roots of five. We check it and there it is. Number six, cube root of three plus four cube root of three. Well, this, there's nothing in front of this cube root of three. Well, there's an implied one there because we have one of those cube roots of three. So a one cube root of three plus four cube root of three, well, that's gonna be five cube roots of three. So remember, if there's nothing written there, it's an implied one. So five cube root of three was the answer. So now the only thing tricky about number seven is there's three terms and one of them's negative. But once again, they're all cube roots of six. So they're all the same object. So we have five of this object minus three of this object plus eight of this object. Well, five minus three is two plus eight would give us 10. So we have 10 cube roots of six. And that's the answer. And that's it. That's how to add and subtract cube roots. If you want to check this page out, I'll include a link down below in the description. It's on andymath.com. Please like this video and subscribe to my channel. Comment below if you have any other math questions. I'll try to get to them. And I'll talk to you guys soon. Bye. Andy math. Hey guys, welcome to this intro to volume. Find the volume for each figure. If you're given one like this, you literally are just going to count the cubes. There's one cube, two, three, four, and five. We can see there's five cubes here. And the answer is going to be five cubic units. So that's how to do these when you can count them. So now for number two, same idea. We can just count the cubes. There's one, two, three, four, five, six. And if we check it, the volume six units. Number three, same thing. We can count. This has got a stack here, but that's okay because we can see there's one underneath it. So it's one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. And we have eight cubes. Same thing for number four. You just count up all those cubes, number five. So now for number six, this is tricky. How do we count all of these? Because we can't see all of them behind there. But what we can do is count the front. And since it is too deep, we can just multiply our answer by two. In fact, we can make counting the front row even easier because this is five across and it's seven down. So if we do five times seven, that'll give us this front wall of cubes. And then we just multiply that by two to get the whole thing. So five times seven by two, that's 35 times two, which is 70. And if we check it, we get 70. So that actually is a general formula. If you know the width, the height, and the depth, if you multiply those three measurements, that will give you the volume of rectangular prisms of any of these types of shapes. They look like cubes, but they're stretched in various directions. They're not perfect cubes. And that's how to do these. So now for seven, eight, and nine, they're all gonna be the same. And these don't even show you blocks anymore, but that's okay because we don't need the blocks because we have these measurements. So you'll be able just to do three times four times seven. If you wanna visit this page on andymath.com, I'll include a link down below to it. And there's also at the bottom of it, we have related pages of all kinds of surface area and volume topics that you can try out. Please like this video and subscribe to my channel. It really helps. Comment below if you have any other math questions you want me to go over. I'll talk to you guys soon. Bye. Andy hey guys, welcome to this video. We're going to find the area and the perimeter of this composite figure or this compound figure. First, we got to fill in the missing pieces. So this whole thing right here is 14. Then that means this whole thing down here would need to be 14. And so this piece is seven, which makes this piece seven feet, because seven plus seven is 14. And then we have the same logic here. Here is 18, then this height must also be 18. And since this piece is eight, that leaves 10 for this piece. So this is 10 feet right here. And now that we have all the sides, it makes it a lot easier to find the area and perimeter. We can do the area first since it says show area first here. There's three ways to find the area. We can either do it like this, find the area of this and this, and then add them together. Or we can chop it here, find the area of this rectangle and the area of this rectangle and add them together. Or the third option, which is my favorite, we can take the area of the large rectangle, this 18 by 14 rectangle, and then subtract this area of the seven foot by 10 foot 
rectangle. So we're going to pull that out. I'll actually show you all three methods, show you they're all not too difficult. So to go this way, this one is going to be 8 times 14, which is 112. And this bottom is 7 by 10, which is 70. So when we add 112 plus 70, we get 182. So the answer should be 182. Let's try it the another way. We'll do this one here. This is eight by seven, which is 56. Oh, and the label here would be feet squared. So this is 56 feet squared. And this one here would be seven by 18, which is 126. Now when we add these together, we get two, eight, one, we get 182 again, 182 feet squared. Now let's do the third method where we subtract. So we have our large rectangle, which is 18 by 14. And we're gonna subtract our little rectangle, which was seven by 10. Because this 18 by 14 included all of this stuff. Now we need to subtract that seven by 10 rectangle to get the area of the composite piece that we started with. So 18 by 14, this is probably the downside of doing it this method, because now we're dealing with large numbers. 4 times 8 is 32, carry the 3. 4 times 1 is 4, plus 3 is 72. Then we have our 0 placeholder. 1 times 8 is 8. And then 1 times 1 is 1. These two things added together, carry the 1, 252. So this big rectangle is 252. And then 7 times 10, that's just 70. Now we subtract these. borrow, we get 182. So no matter what method we used, we got 182 feet squared. So you choose whichever method you like the most. If I had a calculator, I think this one would be the easiest. But let's check the area. And 182 square feet is the answer. So to get the perimeter, we're just going to add up all the sides. 18 plus 14 plus 8 plus 7 plus 10 plus 7. You can use a calculator or we can just do this by hand. 8 plus 4 is 12, plus 8 is 20, plus 7 is 27, plus 7 is 34. Carry the 3. 3 plus 1 is 4, plus 1 is 5, plus 1 is 6. So we get 64 feet is our perimeter. You also could have used a calculator and gotten that as well. And so our perimeter is 64 feet, and that's it. So this is how to find the area and perimeter of composite or compound figures. I have this page on andymath.com with several practice problems. I'll include a link down below in the description if you wanna check it out. There's also these related pages if you wanna practice other area topics, trapezoids, circles, triangles, rectangles. Feel free to check it out. Please like this video and subscribe to my channel. Comment below if you have any other math-related questions. I'm happy to see what I can do. I'll talk to you guys soon. Bye. Andy Math. Hey guys, welcome to this video on rational equations. So we're gonna solve this rational equation. So the best way to do these is to find out what is your common denominator, the thing that both of these could multiply into. And in that case, since these don't go into each other, it would just be five times x plus two. So I'm gonna multiply all three terms by five times x plus two. So this one here times five times x plus two, this term here, times five times x plus two, and this term here times five times x plus two. So I'll rewrite all that in blue. So this first term here is just one times all that stuff. So it's just gonna be all that stuff, five times x plus two, and that's gonna be over x plus two plus. And then this x plus one is gonna get multiplied by all that times five times the x plus two. And on the bottom we have five, and then last, we have another 1 times the 5x plus 2. So this is going to be 5 times x plus 2. So there's step 1. Step 2, you're going to want to cancel if you can. So these x plus 2s now cancel. These 5s cancel. And nothing cancels over here. So let's rewrite this again. This is just a 5 plus, And then we have x plus 1 times x plus 2 equals 5 times x plus 2. And then we can FOIL and distribute. So this would be x squared plus 2x plus 1x plus 2. And if you want more practice with this FOIL stuff, I'll include a link up above for a video that I go over that. 
And then here we're just distributing. And similarly, if you want, I'll include a link up above for you to check out how I did this distribution. So we're gonna come up here in the upper right-hand corner here. So the X squared, I'm gonna rewrite that on the left-hand side. And then this 2x and this 1x would be 3x, and this 5 and this 2 become 7. Now I'm going to bring everything to the side and set it all equal to 0. So I'm going to minus 5x from both sides, and I'll minus 10 from both sides. So this side becomes 0, and this side becomes x squared. 3x minus 5x is minus 2x, and 7 minus 10 is minus 3. Now, in order to solve this, we want to factor. And I'm just going to do it real quick. But if you want to learn how to factor these, check out this link up above to a video about factoring. This will factor into negative 3 and plus 1. And now, once it's factored, I know that either this equals 0 or this equals 0. So either x minus 3 equals 0 or x plus 1 equals 0. And the idea of that is that if two things multiply by each other and equal zero, one of those two things has to be zero. It wouldn't work if it was any other way. And if one of them is zero, it doesn't really matter what the other one is. So if this one's zero, this could be five million, we would still get zero for our answer. So as long as one or the other are zero, we're good to go. I'll add three to both sides and we get x equals three. And if I minus one from both sides or x equals negative 1. That's our answer, x equals 3 or x equals negative 1. We can check it, and that's the same thing we got. So that's how to do these. I'll let you copy this down if you want, or you can pause it. And now I'm going to clear it. So this was on this page on andymath.com. There's several more of these you can try out. I may make videos for them later on, but you can try them all out. And I'll include a link down below in the description. There's also related pages if you want to try some other things on rational expressions. Please like this video and subscribe to my channel. Comment below if you have any other requests for stuff you'd like to learn for math. I'm happy to try to make you a video. I'll talk to you guys soon. Bye. Andy hey guys, welcome to this video. We're going to take the transpose of this matrix. To take the transpose of a matrix, you take this first row and it becomes the first column of your new matrix, of your transpose matrix. You take this row and it becomes the second column and you take this row and it becomes your third column. So we just plug in the values 21, 22, 23. So now I'm going down with them instead of over. This is 41, 42, 43 and 81, 82, 83. And that's it. That's the answer. If I do this and get rid of these circles and then I hit show answer and these two matrices match so that's it that's how to do a transpose of a three by three matrix hope this makes sense if you want to visit this page on andymath.com here it is there's a bunch of notes and examples and there's related pages for all kinds of different matrix stuff but i'll include a link down below in the description for this page you can check out these other related pages. Please like this video and subscribe to my channel. Comment below if you have any other math questions. I'll try to answer them. And I'll talk to you guys soon. Bye. Andy math. Hey guys, welcome to this video. What is the sum of the interior angles of a hexagon? Whoa, so how are we going to solve this? We we'll probably want to need some notes for some context. So there's two things we need to know here. What is a hexagon? So a hexagon is a six-sided polygon, so that takes care of this piece. So the sum of the interior angles of a polygon is n minus 2 times 180, where n is the number of sides of the polygon. So we're just going to do that here. So this hexagon has six sides, so it's going to be 6 minus 2 times 180, because we're plugging in 6 for the n. So 6 minus 2 is 4, and then 4 times 180 is 720 and you can use a calculator or we can do a multiplication by hand but the answer is 720 degrees that's the sum of the interior angles of a hexagon and we can check the answer right here and the answer is 720 degrees
If you want to try more of these, I have this page on andymath.com. I'll include a link down below in the description. It has these notes right here. The notes we used was this piece right here, the interior angles of a polygon, n minus 2 times 180. And we also use this piece of notes right here that a hexagon is a six-sided figure. So you can copy down these notes for your notes. You can also try several more practice problems, even some true and false stuff. And there's related pages as well of stuff similar to this. Feel free to check it out. I'll include a link in the description below. Please like this video and subscribe to my channel. It really helps. Comment below if you have any other math questions, and I will see if I can help you out. I'll talk to you soon. Bye. Hey guys, welcome to this video. We're going to solve for X in this equation and it's the fractions are kind of annoying. So we just want to get rid of that denominator. The easiest way to do that is to multiply by whatever the least common denominator would be. So for five, two, and 10, it's 10. 10 is what each of these numbers will go into. So I'm going to multiply everything by 10, all the terms. So times 10 times 10 times 10. And I'm not also going to multiply the bottom by 10. I'm essentially multiplying by 10 over 1 to both sides. So the bottom's not going to change. And I just like to write it for each term times 10 times 10 times 10. Now watch what happens when we do this. You'll see why this works. So 1 times 10 is 10. So it's 10 over 5x plus 1 times 10 is 10. So it's 10 over 2 equals and 7 times 10 is 70 over 10. And now we can simplify this. 10 over 5 is 2x plus 10 over 2, which is 5, and 70 divided by 10 is 7. And now we can solve this by subtracting 5 from both sides and then dividing both sides by 2. And we get x equals 1. So I went through that pretty quickly. Let's look at it again, what happened. We saw some denominators that we did not like, so we wanted to get rid of them. What did we do? We multiplied by the least common denominator to bust those denominators. And so they didn't go away in the first step, but then once we simplified, they went away. So now we just have a 2x plus 5 equals 7. Now it's easy to solve for x at this point. We just want to get the x by itself. So we minus 5 from both sides, which gave us the 2. And then now to get the x by itself there, we divide it by 2. And that gives us x equals 1. We can check it. So I click right here, we can check the answer, and the answer is x equals 1. If you want to try more of these, I have this page on andymath.com right here. I'll include a link down below in the description, but it has a whole bunch of these you can try out with the answers. There's also related pages for all kinds of different things for solving equations. Feel free to check it out. Please like this video and subscribe to my channel, and I'll talk to you guys soon. Bye. Hey guys, welcome to this video. We're going to evaluate this piecewise function. So it just wants to know what is f of 3 if f of x equals x squared minus 6 if x is less than 4 or 5 if x is greater than or equal to 4. So first it's f of, so we know we're going to be using this function here. Second, we have the 3. So the 3 is what we're going to plug in. So which of these two does it get plugged into? Well, 3 is less than 4 and three is not greater than or equal to four. So it can't be this lower function. We're gonna be plugging into the top piece because it meets the domain requirement. Three is less than four. So now all we do is just plug it in for x. So this will be three squared minus six. And that's what f of three is gonna be. So all this was telling us was which function to plug it into the top or the bottom. Three squared is nine minus six and we get three. So the answer to f of three is three. So once again, with this piecewise function, we just had to figure out which one do we plug it into the top or the bottom. And that's based on which domain it's defined for. And the, the it is the three, it's what domain this three is defined for. And we can check the answer right here. And yeah, the answer is three. It's the same work we just did. If you wanna try more of these, there's this page on andymath.com. There's a whole bunch of these you can try and see if you get the answers for a while. There's a lot of them, uh, 21 of them. I'll include a link down below in the description if you want to try it out. Please like this video and subscribe to my channel. It really helps. Comment below if you have any other math questions you want me to do. I will see what I can do. I'll talk to you guys soon. Bye. Andy math. Hey guys, welcome to this video. We're going to be doing division with decimals. 
we'll do this problem right here, 5.68 divided by 4. Step 1, I'm going to rewrite this as a long division. So it's going to be 5.68 divided by 4. Now with the decimal, as long as there's no decimal on the outside, as long as it's just on the inside, all you have to do is bring the decimal up and now do long division like you normally would. How many times does 4 go into 5? One time. 1 times 4 is 4. Subtract. We get our 1 and then we'll bring down the 6. So it's just a normal, typical long division problem. How many times does 4 go into 16? 4 times. 4 times 4 is 16. We subtract and we have a 0. Now we'll bring down that 8. How many times does 4 go into 8? 2 times. 2 times 4 is 8. And we have 0 left over. This is the answer to the question, 1.42, if we check it. And the answer is 1.42. So that's how to do this one problem. If you want to try more of these, I have this page on andymath.com. I'll include a link down below in the description. But it's got several more decimal division problems you can try. A couple of them have videos. And there's also related pages for multiplying decimals. Please like this video and subscribe to my channel. Comment below if you have any other math questions you want me to try out. I'll see what I can do. I'll talk to you guys soon.